Good morning, everyone. It is uh, June 13th, 2024. This is a meeting of the Oregon Water Resources Commission. Uh, thank you for your patience. Happy to open it this morning. Um, I think for the uh, given the people we have in the room, we'd like to have introductions first before we get to the agenda item A. So I'm Eric Quamps. I'm from the North Central region. I live uh, in eastern rural Oregon, east of Pendleton, out in the foothills of the Blue Mountains. Um, and I'll, I'll start with Commissioner Wolf at the right end of the table, and then we'll go through the commissioners and in the room and um, do introductions, please. And then we'll get to a uh, presentation on the irrigation modern, modernization funding recommendations uh, that will be led by Kim Pritz Ogren. So, Commissioner Wolf. Uh, Woody Wolf, East Region Commissioner. I uh, live in Wallowa, Oregon, which is extreme Northeast Oregon. Hello, Kathy Kahara. I'm the east side at large. I live locally here in Bend. Very nice. <laughs> I'm Julie Smitherman. I'm the Southwest uh, Region Representative, and I live in Talent, which is between Medford and Ashland. I should also add quickly, we normally have microphones, so if you have trouble hearing us, please let us know, and, mm -hmm. and we'll speak up. And uh, an additional benefit, though, is you have swivel chairs, so you can swivel, <laughs> react dramatically, and, and talk with each other. My name is Meg Reeves. I'm uh, West Side at Large, and I live in Corvallis. I'm Jan Lee. I'm Northwest, and I live in Sandy. I'm Joe Mall. I uh, live in Eugene and represent the West Central region. Doug Woodcock, Acting Director for the next two weeks. Who's <laughs> counting? <laughs> Are we all introducing ourselves? Yes. All right. Uh, Dwight French, I work for the department. I'm the Water Rights Services Division Administrator in Seattle. Sarah Kelly, Finance and Operations Director of Deschutes River Control. Jeremy Giffen, Deschutes Basin Water Master. And that is my Technical Services Division Administrator. Carolyn Zuffet, Central Region Manager. Thank you, Wayne. Natasha Bellis, I work for Deschutes Land Trust based here in Bend. Good morning, Emily McCain, Senior Water Advisor of WWRD. Good morning, Kate Fitzpatrick, Executive Director of the Deschutes North Conservancy. Rick Burton, Northern Irrigation District. Burrell, Shoots Basin Water Control and Central Oregon River. Lisa Seals, Programs Manager for the Deschutes River Conservancy. Jeremy Austin, Wildland Water Program Director, Central Oregon Land Watch. April Snell, Oregon Water Resources Congress. Scanlon, Ochoco Irrigation District. Uh, BJ Wessel, Farmers Conservation Office. Steve Johnson, Department of Irrigation District. Yeah. Steve Forrester, uh, City Manager, Brian Hill, and Hawaii mm -hmm. Board Member. I'm Alfred A. Citizen. I'm also Natural Resources Research Development. Raquel Rancier, Deputy, one of the Deputy Directors at the Water Resources Department. I'll also remind folks that ODOT has been wonderful to host us here. They've asked that everybody signs in um, at the front there, so you'll see a little sign in. If you didn't do that, please do so. Just they need that for their records, and they've been really great to work with, so sign we appreciate that. There's a sign in here too, right? This is for the meeting and the sign in out there is for the, <laughs> the building. So sorry to have you sign in twice. Um, unfortunately, different agencies, but we are using their building today and it helps them from a security standpoint. So thank you. Thank you everyone. We'll get into agenda item A. Uh, Kim, did you wanna begin the introductions please? <laughs> Uh, yes, I can do that, though. I just got a message from staff saying that the YouTube uh, live feed isn't working, so I just want to verify that it's up before we dive in. It should be up now. Okay. Great. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, for the record, I'm Kim Fritz Ogren. I am the manager of the planning, collaboration, and investment section at the Water Resources Department. And today, Adair Muth, our grant coordinator, and I are going to present irrigation modernization funding recommendations. This uh, we come to the commission on a regular basis with funding recommendations, uh, and this time things are a little bit unique. 
we're going to ask to fund um, some dollars from a, a new pot of funds, and then we have a request to increase grant funds. So next slide, please. So just as a reminder, uh, funding uh, for water projects is in support of recommended action 13E of the Oregon's Integrated Water Resources Strategy. Next slide. Uh, and a little bit about the, the section and the work that um, the, is done uh, for the irrigation modernization and the planning collaboration and investment section. We're a newer section in the department uh, working with Oregonians to incentivize pursuit of integrative and innovative solutions to complex water management challenges. We do that through a number of ways, including investments. Next slide. And for many years, the primary sources of those funds uh, were place-based planning, feasibility study grants, and water project grants and loans. The idea that there was a trajectory of support to go from planning for your water future, investigating solutions, and then implementing those solutions. Um, but in the recent years, our funding portfolio has increased. So if we click the slide again, uh, I'll note that there are a number of, of new programs either to the department or that have come into uh, my team, including irrigation modernization funding, uh, which we're discussing today. Next slide. The irrigation modernization funding was authorized by the Oregon legislature this past summer in 2023 through House Bill 5030. Uh, in which $50 million was put in the water supply development account for irrigation modernization projects that um, have federal dollars from specific programs that provide uh, the benefits listed in the water project grants and loans program. Um, and then in a particular instance, we'll talk about uh, what happens if those projects conserve water. Uh, WRD and a number of others had conversations with uh, legislative folks as we were setting up these funds to figure out what would be a way to get the dollars out the door and minimize the fiscal impact. And there was agreement we would use an existing grant program, Water Project Grants and Loans, uh, to do so. Next slide. And so just as a reminder for uh, water project grants and loans, what is important are these three public benefit categories, social, cultural, environmental, and economic. And so the purpose of the irrigation modernization funding is to provide funding for water supply projects that improve water use efficiency of irrigation systems on currently irrigated agricultural lands and then achieve public benefits in these three categories. Next slide. And so just to highlight uh, some of the similarities and differences between water project grants and loans and the irrigation modernization funding. So one key difference are the project types, water project grants and loans has a, a broad set of project types versus irrigation modernization is, is focused on that. In terms of match, water project grants and loans has a 25% match requirement, cash or in kind. Um, there's not a particular program that it needs to come from versus irrigation modernization. Uh, those projects need to bring federal match from three specific agencies and programs. And then in terms of scoring in statute, uh, there is a preference uh, for water project grants and loans to give points for where water is legally protected in stream and then for collaboration. Uh, and then with irrigation modernization for uh, projects conserving surface water, um, there is a need for or legislative requirement that there is additional preference points for legally protecting stream flow commensurate with the amount required in ORS 537-470, which is the allocation of conserved water program. Next slide. So uh, these funds were authorized in July, and then I believe in August, the bill came into effect. And in the program stand-up, we consulted with a number of different individuals who were involved in advocating uh, for the funding and, and shaping the funding. Uh, in those conversations, we shared our plans for 
uh, working with the dollars and getting out the dollars out the door in line with legislative intent. And attachment one of the staff report provides a summary of the feedback shared and, and how uh, that feedback was considered and if we changed um, anything as a result of that feedback. And there were a number of instances where we worked to make sure that the funding was meeting the intent of the legislation and also meeting the needs of uh, the potential applicants. Next slide. So another key change that happened in 2023 uh, was that water project grants and loans went from being an annual funding cycle to uh, a requirement by the legislature to offer two funding cycles for, per year. So we elected uh, for efficiency and uh, use of resources that we were going to run the two uh, programs concurrently uh, for that efficiency. I'll note um, a little bit about the fund availability. So for both water project grants and loans and irrigation modernization, they were given a set amount of money. Water project grants and loans was given $10 million. Irrigation modernization was given $50 million. But those funds, um, the sources lottery revenue bonds, and they were split over two different bond sales. Um, often bond sales only occur in the spring of odd years, but fortunately, uh, there was also a bond sale scheduled for uh, the spring of 2024, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, which happened in earlier, earlier this year. Uh, so 25 million uh, was sold for irrigation modernization and 5 million for water project grants and loans. The commission may recall that in November of 2023, we came with funding recommendations and we needed just a little bit more, $28,000 or so, to fund another project um, in full. And the commission chose to dip into the irrigation modernization as the department recommended to fund that other project and get it going. So we have currently just under 25 million available in the account and are expecting to have another 25 million um, put into the account in uh, March or April of next year. And those lottery revenue bonds um, per IRS rules are to be spent within three years of the bond sale. So for the 2024 sale, they need to be spent by the spring of 2027. And for the um, 2025 bond sale, that needs to be spent by the spring of 2028. For water project grants and loans, uh, we have about $7.7 .7 million available unobligated in the account. Um, and that is from that 5 million that was sold this spring. And then very late last month, uh, we received word that one of our grantees was going to need to terminate their grant um, because the project is just not viable moving forward. Sometimes that happens with these really complex projects. And so they're in the process of, of terminating their grant um, and, and returning those, those funds. And so um, we're expecting about $2.7 million back from that project. Next slide. So a little bit about the review process for both of these programs. So applications are submitted to the department and we review them for eligibility and completeness per the requirements in statute. We let uh, affected tribes know of the applications uh, received and share that information and provide an opportunity for government to government conversation and consultation. We post the applications online for a statutorily required 60 day public comment period. Um, and get the applications to our multi-agency technical review team. They start reviewing the applications in that 60-day period. They get the public comments. They consider those. Um, and then we convene for a conversation to score and rank the applications. Then this year, we posted the applications for a three-week public the rec the TRT recommendation, excuse me, for a three-week public comment period. Um, and now we are bringing uh, some funding alternatives to the commission for your consideration and award. Next slide, please. So I mentioned that there's two funding cycles this year in 2024. So uh, the first application deadline was January 17th, 2024. We we're trying to avoid that holiday, but have it 
We wanted, we normally applications are doing spring. We push that up so we could have funding decisions sooner to get dollars out the door, but wanted to have it late enough to avoid that holiday period where we know it's really difficult um, for folks to finish up their applications. We received 10 irrigation modernization applications requesting just under $26 million. As a note, we have just under $25 million currently available in the account. We received no complete water project grants and loans applications uh, in this funding cycle, uh, though uh, we already are hearing interest for the upcoming funding cycle um, with the applications due in July. Next slide, please. The 60-day public comment period for these applications was February 1st through April 2nd. Uh, we received seven public comments, which are attachment four. We received one uh, comment from one tribe on two projects. All of these comments are included in the staff report. Uh, the content of the public comments, um, three were from projects in the Deschutes Basin that were clarifying how they would legally protect water in stream. Uh, in the Deschutes Basin, uh, we've been having conversations with folks where there is a desire to legally protect water in the winter months, not during the irrigation season, uh, which doesn't align with the allocation of conserved water program. So we've been having conversations to sort through how would we legally protect um, this water in stream, and, and the approach wasn't um, determined until after the application deadline. And so the applicants clarified through their public comment um, after those conversations with the department. There were two other comments on applications and then two comments on the general scoring criteria with some concern uh, about how the department had set things up. And I'm gonna talk here in a little bit about the scoring um, to help clarify. Next slide. So the technical review team this year consisted of OWRD, DEQ, ODFW, ODA, Business Oregon, Regional Solutions, and the Oregon Health Authority. They uh, review the applications because these are rather lengthy applications in advance. At times, they consult other regional or local experts in their agency. Um, they, in evaluating the applications, they consider the comments received. Um, we have discussion in the meeting about the applications and the public benefits. And then they score the public benefits, um, all 18 that I'll talk about, um, and make a funding recommendation based on those public benefits. Next slide. When they are scoring the public benefits, the TRT considers the positive and negative impacts of the projects as directed by statute. They're looking to see what's the likelihood of the project achieving the claimed benefits. And so um, we're looking to see what is the change that's going to happen as a result of this project and are looking for supporting evidence or documentation um, about those public benefits. Next slide. Okay, a little bit about Scoring. So the statute for uh, water project grants and loans that is referenced um, for irrigation modernization, and I should clarify, because we received no applications for water project grants and loans, moving forward, we're going to focus the conversation on irrigation modernization. Um, there are three categories identified in statute, and then six public benefits specifically named in statute that the TRT is to evaluate each application on. So we have six questions. Um, we have chosen to use a scale that goes up to 12. So six times 12, you get up to 72 points available in each category. Then the statute also notes that there should be preference for certain projects, including those that legally protect water and stream, and then a preference for collaboration. And so there's 24 points available for preference, 12 for each of those categories. Then um, you'll note with irrigation modernization, there was a new uh, legislative piece added to the evaluation where for surface water, when um, surface water is conserved, there'd be a preference for those that legally protect stream flow commeasurement with the allocation of conserved water program. And uh, 
in our scoring, what we elected to do is have that be a binary, um, where if you uh, use allocation of conserved water or legally protect in stream an amount that would be equal to uh, the rate and volume, if you were to go through that program, you would automatically get 10 points. And OWRD uh, was the one that worked to evaluate that uh, with uh, agency expert staff. So that gets you to a total of 250 points. Next slide. Now, 250 points probably sounds really random and weird and just not what many folks are used to. For a number of years, OWRD used a scoring skill of up to 100 uh, for this grant program. And that was confusing to folks as well. If uh, individuals were used to the American grading system, uh, we had projects coming in at 60, which is like a good project, um, but folks felt like, oh, that's a D, that's not good. And so we adjusted the scoring in, in 2020 um, to try to navigate a number of different things. And so we adjusted the score to try to separate out how can you tell the difference between no benefit, minor benefit, medium, high, and exceptional? Um, before, when we had a scoring approach of 100, uh, it was sort of one through five. And folks had a really hard, oh, what's the difference between a three and a four? It's just one point. And so we, we broadened that out. Um, so you'll see here that there's just that bigger spread to help differentiate uh, projects. Uh, we also wanted to go with that high exceptional score and have it mean it's truly exceptional. And so it's rare. We are not expecting projects to score in all 18 public benefits because they are broad ranging and it would be really difficult for any project to do that. But we wanted the ability for a project who does really is truly exceptional in one of those public benefit categories or public benefit um, criteria to still be competitive. And that's where the, the 12 comes from. Um, <clears throat> I also uh, wanted to note that since we made this change to the funding in 2020, we've had 35 applications scored with this. Those are normally out of 240 points because they don't have that 10 extra points. And the highest score has been 125. The average is 79. And the lowest score that's been funded was 37. It was an ASR uh, project. And I think that provides a little bit of context as we get later into the conversation. Okay, I'll go to the next slide. Uh, in Statute, uh, there is also a requirement to set a minimum score. We have elected seven to be the minimum score since we went uh, to this new scoring approach in 2020. The idea being that a score of seven indicates that the public benefits are more than minor. So if you were to score a one in six, you couldn't be funded. You wouldn't reach that minimum if you only had minor public benefits in each of the six. But if in any case, you went over uh, minor, you would reach that minimum threshold. And just as a reminder, per statute, projects are required to achieve those public benefits in each of the three categories, um, and therefore you must uh, receive a minimum score in each of the categories to be recommended for funded. Next slide. So now Adair is going to take over um, and talk about the TRT funding recommendations and uh, request to increase funding for a project. Thank you, Kim. Good morning, everyone. For the record, my name is Adair Muth. Um, and as Kim mentioned, the TRT met to discuss, score, and rank the project applications. They ranked the projects by the greatest public benefit score and made their funding recommendation based on three things, the public benefit scores, the available funding and in consideration of the second 2024 funding cycle. So based on these three items, the TRT recommends funding projects one through five. Next slide, please. So these are the five projects that are recommended for funding by the TRT. Uh, this table includes the project rank, the project name, the total score and the funding requested. So the TRT recommends funding five projects for a total of approximately $13.5 million. Next slide, please. 
These are the five projects that are not recommended for the for funding by the TRT at this time. Um, note that the two projects with the asterisks did not meet the minimum score of seven in each public benefit category. The TRT encouraged the applicants to revise and resubmit their applications in the next funding cycle. And when we provided the evaluation summaries, we provided those to all applicants when the funding recommendations were posted and also offered to meet with the applicants to further discuss the TRT feedback. And all five project applicants or their consultants have taken us up on our offer. Um, I've met with four of the applicants to walk through the public benefit questions and provide feedback on their applications. Um, the fifth applicant requested a meeting this week, so I am meeting with them later today to provide more feedback. Um, next slide, please. So after the TRT meeting, as Kim mentioned, we held a public comment period on the funding recommendations from May 9th to May 31st. We also reached out to the tribes to invite comment on the funding recommendations and did not receive any additional comments from the tribes. We did receive two public comments on the funding recommendations, one from the Vale, Oregon Irrigation District in support of the Malheur Watershed Council's project, and one from the Oregon Water Resources Congress supporting the funding of all 10 applications. Next slide, please. Um, so switching gears, as Kim mentioned at the beginning, we're also asking the Commission to consider a request to increase the budget for the Mackay Creek Water Rights Switch Project. Next slide. So the Ochoco Irrigation District and the Deschutes River Conservancy, which I will refer to collectively as the grantee after this, uh, received just over $4 million in water project grants and loans funding in December of 2023. Next slide. This project will construct a pump station, six mile pipeline and associated infrastructure along Mackay Creek. And the irrigators along Mackay Creek will trade their privately held Mackay Creek water rights for water rights held by the district sourced from the Prineville Reservoir. In exchange, the irrigators will transfer their Mackay Creek water rights in stream for a total of 11.2 CFS. And the bottom of the screen um, shows the public benefit scores this project received. And I will note that this was the highest ranked project in 2023. Next slide, please. Um, on the right is the overview map of this pretty complicated project. So Water Project Grants and Loans is currently funding the Cox Pump Station and the Mackay Pipeline. But other project components include the Iron Horse Pipeline, two Crooked River pump stations, improvements to the district's conveyance system, and on-farm modernization. Next slide. Uh, in April 2024, the grantee requested to increase their grant award by $7.5 million. And there are several reasons for this request. First, uh, the bids for the pump stations and pipelines that they received in the fall of 2023 were $4.9 million higher than anticipated when they applied for their water project grant in the spring of 2023. Additionally, they did not receive some other anticipated match due to eligibility issues. And unlike other projects that OWRD funds, this project cannot be broken into phases for them to apply for multiple grant applications. Next slide. So we evaluated their budget increase request, considering the available program budget, the availability of funds for future grant cycles, their grant compliance, and the justification for the requested increase. And based on this evaluation, we have provided options for awarding additional funds in table five of the staff report. So due to the complexity this year, considering both the irrigation modernization funding cycle and the Mackay Creek request, we're asking the commission to consider them as one action item. And as a reminder, per statute and rule, the commission shall make the final decision for funding awards based on equal importance of each public benefit category. The awards are based on the greatest public benefit. The awards are those projects that achieve the best outcomes, including funding projects of diverse sizes, types, and geographic locations. And awards are based on the changes resulting from the project. 
And as a note, the scoring and criteria, the scoring and ranking criteria that Kim went over considers all of the items on this slide except the funding of projects of diverse sizes, types, and geographic locations. So in table five of the staff report, which I will refer to you, you to a lot, <laughs> we lay out a number of funding alternatives for the irrigation modernization projects and the Mackay Creek project request. So as Kim noted, there's approximately 24.9 million in unobligated irrigation modernization funds. And there's approximately 7.7 .7 million in unobligated water project grants and loans funds. Um, as Kim noted, we do have another funding cycle. Applications are due July 10th, and we um, have we do anticipate at least five applications for water project grants and loans. There has been interest. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So the total of all projects that met the minimum public benefit category scores, which is table four in the staff report, and the full Mackay Creek project request totals approximately $29.9 million. Next slide. Okay, so in table five, again, of the staff report, we lay out numerous options for both the irrigation modernization projects and the Mackay Creek request and the associated trade-offs with each alternative. So for example, alternative one is to fund table three of the irrigation modernization projects, which is the TRT recommendation, and decline to award any additional funds to the Mackay Creek project for a total award of $13,448,829. And then the table includes the associated trade-offs with that alternative. <laughs> that is just the first alternative though. Uh, table five provides seven alternatives for the commission to consider. So for the purposes of this presentation, I've separated the information to include the irrigation modernization trade-offs on this slide, and then the Mackay Creek alternatives and trade-offs on the subsequent slide mainly due to space constraints. So for the irrigation modernization, the commission may fund table three, which is the TRT recommendation. This would fund the higher benefit projects. It would ensure funds are available for future higher benefit projects and would promote equity by reserving funds for future projects that are further behind in the federal process. Another option is the commission may fund table four. This would fund all projects that met the minimum public benefit category scores. It would limit fund availability for future projects that may provide higher benefits, and it would limit fund availability for future projects further behind in the federal process. And a final option, which is alternative seven in the staff report, is the commission could fund table three, plus one or more of the projects in italics in table four, which are those projects that met the minimum public benefit score, but were not recommended by the TRT. Next slide, please. The funding alternatives for the Mackay Creek project, again, outlined in table five of the staff report, are the commission could decline to award any additional funds, this does not help the project meet their budget shortfall. The commission could award an additional $4 million to the project. This would increase funds to help the project and provide the minimum amount that the grantee has indicated to us is needed to keep this project viable. The commission could award an additional $4.9 million to the project. This would provide the funds to address the costs due to inflation. Or the commission could award 7.5 million to the project. This would provide the full request from the grantee and address their budget shortfall. It would concentrate funding in one project versus distributing funds amongst many projects. The Mackay Creek project is already the largest grant award in program history at just over $4 million. And the requested increase is almost double the amount of the original grant. Not on this slide, but in the staff report as alternative seven, is the commission could award a different amount uh, not listed in these alternatives. And I just want to note the Mackay Creek project does meet the eligibility criteria for irrigation modernization funding. 
So the commission could award irrigation modernization funds, water project grants and loans funds, or a combination of the two. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So rather than list uh, all of the possible options the commission could consider, we have pr provided a fill in the blank template for okay. options. So the first option the commission may consider is to adopt alternatives, you fill in one through seven, contained in table five of this report to fund five to eight applications listed in table three or four for a total award amount of you fill in the blank, and to increase the Mackay Creek Water Rights Switch Project Grant Award by insert the amount. Uh, the second option is to direct the department to further evaluate the applications and return with revised alternatives. Slide. So uh, thank you so much for your time. Kim and I are very happy to answer any questions. And additionally, uh, many applicants are in attendance, both in person and via Zoom, um, and have expressed openness to answering questions as well. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Kim and Adair. Um, while the presentation is fresh in the Commission's mind, if there's any clarifying questions of the Commission, I'd like to take those now, please. We have several people that want to comment on this. So um, if there's any Need for clarification from the presentation, commissioners. I have a process question. Um, first of all, can you all hear us okay online with these mics? Okay. Yes, we can. Thanks. Um, I dare you mentioned that applicants have been in touch or are, are to be in touch uh, about resubmitting or where they may have fallen bef below the line, so to speak. I get the impression both from the the um, the application summaries, as well as past conversation, that oftentimes the conversation has to do with how to make a better application. And my question is, in these conversations for the five, six, uh, that currently are not recommended for funding, either because they just don't rank or because two of them scored six, do you have any sense whether or not the projects themselves will change at all? or will we simply get more robust applications? Yeah, thank you for the question. Sorry, struggling with the mute button. Um, that's a very good question. I think most of the projects, based on my conversations, we will get more robust projects. Some of them are looking at um, how to increase that environmental score, and so the projects might change um, to increase that environmental score. So a little of both, I think. Okay. Um, my other question is, do you have, uh, I don't see in the application process or in the review, any conversations about project readiness? Commissioner Mal, I can I can take that question. So in the application questions, there is one that asks about feasibility um, and a number of opportunities for folks to uh, talk about readiness, and that is considered in the likelihood of <laughs> achieving public benefits. We're looking, are you ready to you know implement your project that gives us increased certainty that these public benefits are going to be achieved? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have I'm I have some confusion about the Mackay Creek situation. Um, I think I think you said that the project would not be eligible to break into parts for further application under the Water Project Grants and Loans program, but that if we if the commission wanted to increase funding for this project. The funding could come from modernization or from water project grants and loans or both. Is that accurate? Yes, Chair Quemps, Commissioner Reeves. Projects are evaluated based on the, the change that will occur. 
um, as described in the project. And we direct folks very clearly in the TRT to not consider past changes, like things that have already happened um, or things that are theoretical might happen as a result of this project in the future. We're really looking to see what would these public dollars actually produce. Um, and so for the Makai Creek project, uh, how their project worked, they um, presented the whole project um, when they applied in 2023, all of those components that Adair mentioned. Um, and within that, the TRT scored all of their public all the public benefits in that whole project. And that's what was awarded for funding. Um, and so if they were to, it couldn't really come back to water project grants and loans and apply again because they already got those points um, and they'd be sort of double dipping. And that's where it comes from. But, and that's where we directed uh, or advised them that we, they couldn't reapply, but we could have this conversation with the commission about increasing the fund award. Um, and so it's a tricky space where they couldn't reapply, but it's totally okay to, um, if the commission wants to increase their budget, dipping into water project grants and loans or irrigation modernization. I hope that clarifies. It is a, a bit. Um, well, I, it sort of does. Um, so they, they cannot apply further in that program, but we have the evaluation, everything from December, but they haven't applied in the modernization program and we're still being told that we could award funds out of that. Is that, do I have that right? Yeah, I, they could not apply uh, for irrigation modernization because once again, it's the same public benefits uh, statute for both programs statute identifies the same public benefits that they have achieved. So it'd be a bit of double dipping, but yes, you can, they are, uh, they meet the eligibility criteria for irrigation modernization in terms of they have the federal match um, that is required for that program and they produce the public benefits. So it's like our discretion to increase the award from the- Right, but I, it was the, coming out of a, the no two pot. funding pots are confusing to me. We have a lot of discretion. Well, apparently we do. Commissioner <laughs> Lee? Yes, thank you. Um, when you did the readiness review, do you know if any of the projects not funded, the, the bottom six, four, whatever it was, uh, will they lose federal funding if they're not funded? Commissioner, thank you for the question. We did reach out um, to all five and as part of those conversations, asked to understand if that would um, cause them to lose their federal funding because that's certainly not something we want to happen. And um, four of the five said it would not impact their federal funding. Two of them, I believe, still have their federal funding pending. Um, I didn't hear back from the fifth one, but I, they didn't indicate that it would be a problem, which I'm sure they would have reached out to me if it was. So thank you. I have another question related to readiness um, because some of these require collaboration and, and all the planning that goes into getting these ready. Um, I'm wondering, if, you know, there's a staff alternative too, is to to uh, direct staff to further evaluate the proposals and come back. Is that realistic for all of these applicants uh, in terms of timing and their ability to implement these projects? Chair Quemps, my understanding is that there are some projects that it is beneficial to have a funding decision today in June at the latest um, in order for their boards to feel comfortable um, putting in orders for some of the materials that are required by the projects that have long lead times. Um, so they have to put the order in in advance um, in order to meet in water work windows or um, be able to do the work outside of the irrigation season. Um, and I believe that some of those folks are in the, in the room virtually or in person and can speak to that in more detail. But in the, the fun stand-up conversations, uh, there were some projects that needed decisions in June, which is why we targeted uh, this commission meeting. Thank you for that. And then a, a, another question related to the Mackay project. So part of the reason that we're bringing this forward, it sounds like, in, the, in offering the discretion to the commission is that there was $2.7 million canceled from another project that 
um, offers a little opportunity to assist with the project. So That's I just want to call correct. attention to that. That is correct. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Reeves? Yeah, just one more question. Um, just to, I think there are two projects that did not um, have minimum scores in every category. Is that right? And are those projects anywhere in Table 5? I, I, I didn't go through to try to figure out whether there are, are they, they are not presented as an alternative for funding. Correct. They are not. And that's accepting the, the premise that we're going with that the water, we're using the criteria from the water project grants and loans program to evaluate all these projects, right? Okay. Just point of clarification on that. According to the report, the commission uh, determines the final scoring. So we have the ability oh, to determine that stuff. those two applications yeah, two meet the minimum not. seven Four instead scores. of the minimum sixes that they have according to the record. But none of those projects are in this table five. I don't think, I don't think right. so. Both of those things are correct. The commission determined per statute, the commission can change the scores. Um, and we can get the numbers to you very quickly if that is the path that you want to go down because those projects are not listed in table five. But, but the scores are. Yes. We, we do have the score in the, end. In the report. Yes. Vice Chair um, On the two projects that didn't meet the minimum requirements, um, I know Adair said she reached out to, to speak with them. Is that something that they're prepared to revise their applications and submit for the next cycle? Yes, I believe both are planning on revising and resubmitting for the next cycle. Okay, thank you. Mr. Wolf. Thank you. Dr. Ready for public comment. Thank you. We'll move to uh, public comment then on this agenda item A. Um, we have people signed up. Uh, I'll list the first two that are in person April Snell and then Natasha Bellis. Chair Quince, listeners, for the record, my name is April Snell, Executive Director with the Oregon Water Resources Congress. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to comment on the proposed funding before you. I've also submitted brief written comments, which were included in your packet. I will admit, I didn't think I was going to go first. Uh, but, uh, I do appreciate that opportunity. So um, first off, I do want to thank uh, Kim and Adair and associated staff for their efforts in getting this application process up and running. Um, the $50 million that we secured during the last legislative session was specifically designed to leverage federal funding from the three pots that were mentioned in the presentation. So that's the Natural Resource Conservation Service, Bureau of Reclamation, Water Smart Program, and EPA. Those funds, by and large, were authorized through federal legislation, the infrastructure, uh, sorry, the IRA, the BIL, I'll just use those for, for short, and those federal funds are fairly significant and historic in both the amounts of money that were allocated through there, as well as the opportunity to do many great things here in Oregon and throughout the West. The likelihood of those funds happening again and at least the near term, like the next 10 years, is highly unlikely. Not all of those funds have been fully uh, put out by the federal entities, in particular Bureau of Reclamation um, is just now starting to roll out some of their funding that was authorized through those programs. And there's additional money um, that will be coming out from NRCS as well as EPA. So I mentioned that because we were the primary advocate for this funding that we secured in the last biennium. The purpose of the funding was specifically to leverage these projects to ensure that they could provide 
the state match that's necessary for three programs that have three very different sets of robust requirements that need to be met before they can move forward. When we had the, uh, basically at the end of the session in 2023, there were negotiations over this set of funding. And ultimately we agreed that it going through the water resources department and having uh, specifically that there would be public benefits identified and that there would be priority given to projects that were putting water in stream permanently through the allocation of conserved water program or something similar. Those were supposed to be the only requirements of the program in addition to securing funds from the three sources. We wanna make sure that we're not creating something that is overly cumbersome and duplicative requirements that are already being uh, required by those three federal entities. There is a second cycle of funding and I've encouraged every single district project who is not recommended for funding today um, to apply for that. And then there's a second set of districts uh, who are also looking at that. So when we worked on this funding during the 2023 session, uh, we had a list of projects that we developed in collaboration with our technical allies at Farmers Conservation Alliance with districts with those three pots of money as well as other federal funding sources and when they would need to have that funding secured in order to move forward. And that was one of the questions you guys had earlier. And so as far as timing, there's two aspects at least of timing that's very critical. One, once they have secured the federal funding, those three different programs have slightly different requirements as far as when the match needs to be in hand but by and large, that match has to be secured before they can move forward with those projects. The second aspect, which was also um, mentioned, is for the districts to move forward, besides having the match secured, they have to have time to do public bids and go through other public processes before they can actually do construction. The last aspect in timing is that for construction, irrigation district projects are limited to the non-irrigation season primarily to do any of this work. So that is from October to April. So if they're not able to implement something this fall, which potentially the decision you make today will allow some districts to do that, they will be waiting until fall of 2025 to move forward with those projects. So the further delays that there are in securing the match and moving forward with the process, that increases the likelihood that some of these projects will not move forward at all, that they will have to scale back what they are planning on doing, or they will seek other funding sources. So the other part that I wanted to mention is um, public benefits can be defined rather broadly. And as Commissioner Mole mentioned, ultimately this commission has the decision and the authority to decide which projects you think are beneficial. Having viable agriculture throughout the state is a public benefit. And the districts in the programs that they're using, again, NRCS, Bureau of Reclamation, and EPA, each of those programs, they all have an environmental component. They all have an economic component. And I think it's really important to recognize that if a project does not have clearly articulated benefits um, that match up with this overly complicated scoring system, it doesn't mean that they do not have public benefits. So um, the projects that you have before you today, I would urge that you allocate as much funds as you possibly can. Uh, the alignment that we had is that there would be 25 million in this first cycle and that the remaining funds would be allocated in the second cycle so that when we start the next legislative session, those funds are out the door and being used just as they were intended to be with the legislators that we advocated for this funding. Will there be more projects in the future? Yes, but there's a longer process for those to get ready, secure the federal funds. If they're going through the watershed planning process with NRCS, that is a several year process. I will also mention that the ability for districts to add components to these projects that have already been approved by the federal entities is very limited. 
Can they describe them better? Yes, and we're gonna work on that with all of them. Um, but I think something you guys have, have had discussions about in the past is diversity and equity. And in the agricultural sense, while we are here in Central Oregon with many of my districts here in the room, this area traditionally has received a large amount of funding because they have been ahead of the curve, so to speak. And they are leading the way for the rest of the state and showing both what is possible and what can be. And now you're starting to see those other projects from Umatilla and Oahe and Klamath and Hood River, and they need funding too to move forward. So I would urge you to consider both the urgency and the timing in getting the money out to leverage this very historic and limited federal funding that's out there, as well as the need to incentivize other districts to look at these breadth of projects before you and recognize what they could do and submit something in the future. Without a little bit of help from the state, many of these projects will wither and die on the vine and you won't see the benefits that we're all hoping to see, which is not only for the agriculture, for the environment and for the communities we're all in. So again, I thought I was gonna be able to dovetail off some other comments um, out there, but I really am hopeful that you will allocate as much of the funds as you feel comfortable with, with the, the notion that unlike the regular water supply uh, grants and loans program, the 50 million was not designed to be a permanent program. It's meant to leverage this time sensitive federal funding. So with that, uh, I urge you to fund as many of the projects you can. And we're also supportive of Ochoco Irrigation District getting additional funding from the existing water project grants and loans program, particularly since there are new, no new applicants for that program. It makes sense to uh, help, help out Ochoco as well. So um, with that, I will stop talking and answer any questions you may have. Thank you, April. Any questions for April? Jerry, can I make a suggestion, however, Natasha, do you mind? No. Um, can we group the comments uh, for the general program and Mackay Creek separately? So we would have all the comments that are general like yours, followed by all the comments on Mackay Creek. Is that acceptable to everybody here? Uh, absolutely. No concerns. That makes sense. Because I, I think it's a, they're distinctly different discussions. That's why I would prefer we did that. Well, so I'll have to have people just identify what, what you're going to be commenting on. It's not listed on here. So uh, we we'll take comments on the general program first and then comments specific to Mackay after that. So um, Natasha Bellis, were you going to comment on the On Mackay. Oh, OK, OK. Um, Kate Fitzpatrick. Bruce Scanlon? On Mackay. Okay. Steve Forrester? Mackay. Okay. And Chris Gannon? Online in Delaware. Okay. <laughs> so that's all about the only, those are the only comments we have. Gene Towson's online is? He's probably not playing my phone. Yes, playing. He's playing Did you say Gene Souza, sir? Yes, were you going to comment on the agenda item A, the general program? Yes, general program, sir. Great. Okay. Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Quimps, Commissioners. Uh, Gene Souza, Klamath Irrigation District, uh, Executive Director. Uh, I'm going to echo everything that April Snell just said. Uh, I agree with uh, her work and the work that the irrigation districts have done with our legislators uh, to get this $50 million to help move these projects forward is paramount. I just want to focus uh, specifically on Klamath Irrigation District. Uh, I've got a number of projects that are focused on water savings. As we all know, Klamath is an area of conflict. And what I'm trying to do within the Klamath Irrigation District is find efficiencies. While Klamath Irrigation District uh, itself is part of the Klamath Reclamation Project, and Klamath Reclamation Project is deemed about 93% efficient, one of the best in the nation, Klamath Irrigation District's uh, efficiencies are only about 63%. 
And so what we're doing is trying to find where we can find water savings that result in efficiencies or vice versa efficiencies that result in water savings. Uh, before you today is a small portion of what Farmers Conservation Alliance has been partnering with on uh, to include in Klamath County, the D system improvement plan is just a small portion of that. We didn't include a larger funding uh, source or a larger uh, project because we plan to come to you again uh, to look at different portions of the D system improvement plan. I've also got in the works uh, the A3 urban canal, the C urban canal, and A urban canal, which I'm also trying to find federal funding uh, opportunities for. Uh, for this specific uh, grant that we applied for for this year, uh, the public benefits include water savings, and water savings results in storage in Upper Klamath Lake. Uh, what that means is that if I do not divert that water because I've saved it, that means it's available for Upper Klamath Lake, which uh, addresses uh, some claims for lake levels, such as claim 622 uh, for up climber, Upper Klamath Lake. It also addresses for public benefit uh, junior water right holders or junior contract holders, which include uh, the irrigation districts that Klamath Irrigation District serve, which have been denied water or sufficient amount of water over the past four years. And it also may provide in wetter years the opportunity for the next junior water right holder, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, to be able to move that water into a location that is be more beneficial as deemed by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, I would uh, to, to say that I appreciate everything the team has done. You've got an outstanding team that's looked at everything. Uh, Farmers Conservation Alliance uh, met on my behalf with your team. And as mentioned, we are going to uh, increase, if we're not funded today, uh, increase our uh, wordsmithing on this application, uh, look at what we're doing and make sure that we're, we're fitting in within the, the small criteria uh, that is being judged upon. Uh, but behind that, I've got probably three additional applications that are forthcoming. I'm open to any comments or questions. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Thank you for your time and comments. Um, so now we'll return back to the room, I think, and uh, begin with Natasha Bellis. Yes. Good morning, Chair Clemps and members of the commission. My name is Natasha Bellis and I'm the conservation director at Deschutes Land Trust based here in Bend. We consistently conserve and care for the lands and waters that sustain Central Oregon so that local communities and the natural world can flourish together for generations to come. We currently hold title to or interest in over 18,000 acres of land in the Deschutes Basin. And we're here today to express support for increased funding for the Mackay Creek Water Rights Switch Project. The Crooked River Subbasin is one of our primary areas of focus, both for its ecological significance and for the role it plays in Central Oregon's rural economy. In 2020, we purchased a property located at the confluence of Mackay Creek and the Crooked River, which we call Ochoco Preserve. While our land protection approach in Crook County is typically to protect land from development by working with landowners to secure conservation easements, we chose to purchase this property in recognition of the extraordinary potential Mackay Creek represents to the viability of salmon and steelhead populations. We introduced to this basin by the Confederated Tribes, the Warm Springs and Portland General Electric almost 20 years ago. With greater numbers of salmon and steelhead returning to the Crooked River, spawning habitat is vital to securing these populations viability. Put simply, Mackay Creek is the Lower Crooked River's best chance for this habitat and for a successful reintroduction effort but it does need work. And the DRC's Mackay Creek Water Rights Switch Project before you today is a giant step in the right direction. Not only does the project provide significant reach specific ecological impacts, which include restoration and legal protection of 11.2 CFS, um, which is the creek's natural hydrograph. It also provides community benefits, including enhancing the economic viability of local agriculture by providing more reliable irrigation water. And the project also provides broader reaching benefits for the land trust work specifically at the confluence of Mackay Creek by providing additional water stream flows to the lower reaches, which enhances the habitat restoration work that we are doing on Ochico Preserve. And it also provides migrating salmon and still had better access to Mackay Creek. The project will also eliminate diversion infrastructures in that middle, in the project reach, the middle reach of Mackay Creek, which increases future opportunities 
for our partners, the Crooked River Watershed Council and the Land Trust to partner on habitat restoration projects with willing landowners there. So there's just broad reaching um, benefits of this project. We strongly support Oregon Water Resource Departments and the Commission's increase in funding for the Mackay Creek Water Rights Switch Project. Without the additional funding, the project risks losing the landowner support it has worked so hard to procure over the last couple of decades. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Oh, is there any questions? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Just a moment and leave. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Kate Fitzpatrick, please. Deschutes River Conservancy. <clears throat> Good morning, Chair Clemson, and members of the commission. My name is Kate Fitzpatrick, and I serve as the executive director of the Deschutes River Conservancy based here in Bend, Oregon. The DRC's mission is to restore stream flow and water quality in the Deschutes Basin. We were formed by a unique collaboration between the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, Education and Environmental Interests in 1996, and we operate through the consensus of a multi-stakeholder board of directors. Thank you for the opportunity to provide comment on the Mackay Creek water rights switch. We have extensive materials describing the project, so I'll keep my comments focused. Uh, I've been working on this project since 2008 and would like to provide some contextual history that I think is important um, from my perspective of being in the room when this project was conceived. In 1964, the Pelton Round Butte Dam complex was constructed on the Deschutes River, severing the Lower Deschutes River from the Middle and Upper Deschutes River. Despite fish passage provisions, fish passage failed and salmon and steelhead were extirpated from the upper basin. Fifty years later, as part of the FERC relicensing process, the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs became co-owners of the dam, and the reintroduction of anadromous fish above the dam became a license requirement. Restoring anadromous fish runs was, a, was and is a central priority of the tribes and of conservation interests. In 2007, fish were reintroduced to the Crooked River and Wychus Creek. Coincident with this, mid-Columbia summer steelhead were listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. These events created deep concern and fear in Crook County, a community defined by agriculture as irrigators for the first time in 50 years now had an ESA listed species introduced back into the rivers and creeks they used for irrigation. Public meetings at that time were rife with conflict. Conversations about buying water rights in Mackay Creek were not welcome. The Mackay Creek water rights switch was conceived at that time as an elegant way to restore stream flows to the most important steelhead spawning tributary in the Crooked River while supporting existing uses of water. This was an unusual opportunity afforded by uncontracted storage in Prineville Reservoir. The idea was to provide a small portion of that unallocated stored water to Mackay Creek irrigators in exchange for permanently transferring their Mackay water rights and stream and pulling all irrigation infrastructure out of the creek. This project has brought the community together around restoring habitat for fish, and the community has achieved many milestones together along the way, including federal legislation in 2014 that dedicated stored water in Prineville Reservoir to the project, the completion of a habitat conservation plan with the federal fish agencies that includes this project as conservation action, and the title transfer of reclamation facilities to Ochico Irrigation District. It's a large project and it's a big ask, managing a project that has grown over 18 years in scale and complexity, albeit with an increasing range of benefits has been a challenge. Securing and maintaining funding, seeking new funding, keeping landowners, 17 landowners on board for well over 15 years and in the midst of inflation and increased supply chain issues. We find ourselves today with a project finally ripe for implementation that permanently restores 11.2 CFS, the natural hydrograph, to a tributary critical to the reintroduction of anadromous fish in the Deschutes Basin, and which secures better water rights for Mackay Creek irrigators while benefiting all of Ochoco Irrigation District through a modernized pump and conveyance system. Conservation partners stand ready with plans to implement synergistic physical habitat restoration projects. We are bringing $40 million in secured funding to the table. Dedicating the remaining funding gap, 7.5 million, would get this project over the finish line and avoid risks of further inflationary cost increases, existing grant expiration dates, and landowner, landowner turnover and burnout. In short, the time is now. We believe the legislative intent of the irrigation modernization funding was to support projects with public benefits, such as, the, as these, to leverage federal funds in this unique moment. 
we deeply appreciate your time and consideration for this request. Thank you. And I'm available to answer any questions if there are. Thank you. Yeah, so so with this funding that you're requesting, you're saying that this project would be completed. Correct. Uh, and across the finish line. Across the finish line. <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay, that was my main question. Thank you. Thank you for that. Any other questions? Thank you. Uh, can we have Bruce Scanlon, please? And then... After that, Steve Forrester. Good morning, uh, Chair Clemps and uh, commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm going to struggle to be as eloquent as the <laughs> two prior uh, that have chatted. So uh, uh, for the record, my name is Bruce Scanlon. I'm the manager of Ochoco Irrigation District in, in Prineville, Oregon. And uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity to share with you the, uh, the, the discussion on the support for the additional funds for the Mackay Switch Project. Um, uh, OID requests that the commission carefully consider what the, um, that the unique and, and hugely significant benefits of this project can provide to the community in, and into the state of Oregon itself. Uh, the Mackay Switch Project is a rare revolutionary project that takes advantage of once in a generation federal funding uh, to leverage private and state funding to achieve project outcomes that provide multiple benefits for all stakeholder groups. And this truly is a win-win project. Not only does this project permanently restore the 11.2 CFS uh, in stream, uh, it also delivers up to an additional 2,750 acre feet of water uh, applied to uh, approximately 685 acres of irrigated land in the Mackay Valley. Uh, the, to deliver that additional water, OID um, will need to replace two large pumping stations uh, that were originally constructed in 1960. Those uh, pumps have served the district well for the past 60 plus years and, uh, and done their, their job, uh, but they uh, are increasingly difficult to operate and maintain. They uh, uh, Servicing and repairing of those pumps is, and the motors associated with them is costly because all the parts uh, are, have to be custom made. And we... Um, they, we have to seek out fabricators that know how to build those things. Um, uh, new pumps provide benefits to the entire district through improved efficiency, through reduced maintenance costs, and greater reliability. When they shut off, people don't get their water. Um, that's just the reality of it. Uh, additionally, this project has the potential uh, to unite diverse interest groups. We see the, the people sitting in here that have already talked. Um, it shows collaboration instead of division uh, at the right time. And, and steelhead reintroduction is entering another milestone with the expected change in status from uh, non-essential non exper experimental status uh, to a threatened status under the ESA uh, beginning January 15th of 2025. The project moving forward provides additional water in the creek for the fish. It extends the irrigation season for farmers that are in the Mackay uh, Valley. It provides necessary upgrades and modernization to the irrigation district, to our aging infrastructure, and it improves efficiencies in water delivery. The Mackay Switch is also an integral component to the Jeshut Space and Habitat Conservation Plan. Uh, the HCP includes language to incorporate the additional flows in Mackay Creek after the project is complete. Uh, Measure CR3 specifically addresses Mackay Creek flows and incorporates the implementation and the benefits from this project. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and, and NIMS have been avid supporters of this project. The window of opportunity that currently exists for Oregon to capitalize on the multiple benefits of this project will not stay open indefinitely. OID requests that the commission take extraordinary steps to ensure that this extraordinary project uh, moves forward as quickly as possible. I did want to just kind of add what I think Kate uh, emphasized is the significant amount of federal, state, and private funding that has already been um, uh, secured for this project. 
We have made progress in completing the first step in constructing Crook River Pump Station Number One. Uh, over $13 million pump station is now up and operational. That is the first lift of additional water for supplying water to Mackay Creek. We've just finished um, uh, awarding um, a notice to proceed or notice uh, to award on the next leg of the journey connected to that pump station we call the Iron Horse Pipe. And that uh, is going out to bid. Our partners, the city of Prineville uh, and, and OID will be constructing that here starting this next month and concluding that at the end of this irrigation season. And, uh, and, and then we hope to be able to uh, move to the next step that's already designed and ready to go with Crooked River Pump Station number two. So the $11.5 million that we're asking for here um, is, is uh, still a, a, it's a big number. I get it. It's a large ask. It's bold. Um, but the benefits are extraordinary. And it still represents less than 25% of the overall cost um, of, of the project. That's it. Thank you. Chris Motherman. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, understanding a little bit more about the pump stations. Um, with those improvements that you're making with the pump stations and with the whole system, are you are you finding that um, farmers and, and agricultural community are mod also modernizing their irrigation practices? Yeah, I mean, one of the requirements of the Mackay uh, switch is as as those individuals come online, they will they'll be um, utilizing more efficient irrigation systems. Many of them flood irrigate throughout the area, and so they will be uh, transferring to a, a, a pressurized um, sprinkling uh, kind of a system. And so those efficiencies are there. I think that the other factor that um, that uh, comes into play here is we're on the tail of a um, epic historic drought that has really uh, shifted the focus to of uh, many irrigators in our region to uh, to to be very sensitive to the precious resource that we that we do manage. And so there's a significant number of those other. Um, kinds of things going on, uh, lots, of, lots of discussion that we could have on other upgrades and, and issues for um, managing and, and measuring and, and conserving water. Great, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Carr. Uh, um, I have a question on uh, the, the funding from our, your other partners. Have you also asked them for increased funding like through the WaterSmart I used to manage that program, so I'm just a little curious. Yeah, that's, that's a that's a good uh, question, uh, Commissioner Carr. And um, when we uh, we did go after some water smart funding, and when we uh, when we looked at these two federal funds coming together, the uh, NRCSPL 566 uh, program is a 75-25 match. Um, and when you bring it, uh, a, a a funding source that has a different funding uh, split to it, 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 it automatically goes to the lower funding 50-50, um, for example, for a water smart grant. Right. And, and that was one of the reasons why we, um, we didn't hit the goal that we had um, with the original ask for the water project grants and loans project. Um, so yes, we've explored that. There are other funders that uh, we hope to be able to continue to go after if uh, we are successful here, uh, but the, uh, the timelines are such that uh, it's going to take some time to get, uh, get those things online, and, and we are at a critical point um, with uh, construction, with keeping everybody in, in, in motion on this. All right. I, I just remember in the past when there was a big... Uh, increase in pipe costs that some districts were able to come back through me through water smart to get additional funding on their original grant and i was just wondering if that was we have maxed out our uh, pl 566 uh, opportunity so the uh, complete uh, because we have a, a watershed uh, plan ea uh, there is a, a 25 million dollar cap on that okay. so we have capped that all right, thank you. That's, that funding source at least is capped, yes. Thank you. Commissioner Lee? Yes, uh, one of the recommendations or suggestions was to fund four million additional. If you were to receive four million, 
how could you proceed without the other 3.5? It um, the, the additional four million would uh, fund the construction of Crooked River Pump Station Number Two, which is the next lift in the in the process. So it it it, it allows for us to continue construction, but it does not fund the additional uh, for the Mackay uh, switch itself, the new Cox Pump Station and pipeline that delivers the water to those individuals, we would still need to, uh, to uh, find those additional three and a half million dollars. Uh, so that's really what it does. It says it, it funds the next step. Uh, it doesn't get us across the finish line by any means, but it, it at least gives uh, us the ability to move forward. Um, there's a long lead time, as uh, I think Kim or Adair, I can't remember, mentioned for uh, lots of the electrical components, uh, MCC controls and uh, switchgear. Uh, all, all of those things take up to a year in uh, procurement windows. So uh, those, those challenges are very real to us. And so we, um, we, 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 we have a sense of urgency to try to get things, to keep, continue moving forward on that. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Maltz. Um, thanks, Bruce. Really helpful. <clears throat> Can you tell us how many members of the district there are and what your total acreage is? What I'm hearing is this will have direct benefit, obviously, to Mackay Creek and that longstanding project, but also to the larger district. And I'd love to get a sense for uh, what that means. Yeah, so Ochoa Irrigation District is... Um, just over 20,000 irrigated acres in the Brineville Valley. We have just under um, 800 uh, patrons that we uh, serve within the irrigation district boundaries, adding the additional Mackay, um, uh, approximately 17 uh, patrons uh, to the district. We, uh, we own and operate uh, Ochco uh, Reservoir, small reservoir uh, just uh, to the east of town. We also operate uh, Prineville Reservoir and Bowman Dam. That's a, a Bureau of Reclamation facility. And we have approximately 120 miles of irrigation canals and, and pipeline, uh, multiple pump stations, about 30 pump stations that we uh, operate around the district. Uh, we are the primary source of uh, irrigation within the Prineville Valley. If you, if you drive into the, Prineville area over the viewpoint there and look, if it's green this time of year, it's because of water that's been uh, delivered through the irrigation district. So, so with, with that in mind, and this is kind of putting you on the spot, but we're on the spot for making the decision. What, what would, what, often, what's your gut on if the uh, commission decided instead to grant a loan for that amount rather than, or some portion of that amount rather than a grant, maybe a forgivable loan with some deliverables tied to riparian area, uh, floodplain work with the partners you're already working with or something like that. You, what do you think your members would, how they would respond to that? And would that be uh, feasible for you all to operate with? It looked like from your original application that you all have about $900,000 in loan, uh, a, 0.98% interest rate loan with feds. How, how would that sit? Yeah, that, that's a great uh, question, Commissioner. And it's an interesting uh, dilemma that we run into. Um, when it comes to loans or bonding, um, we've consulted with our, our attorney and uh, under uh, various ORSs, and I could uh, cite those for you, um, it, there, there are certain limits on what the irrigation district can uh, go out for in loan or bonding without having some kind of a vote or election for those things. Um, if you're familiar with some of the, uh, the local bonds that have been uh, put forward uh, recently, like at school bonding, et cetera, um, they have not been hugely successful. Uh, and part of that problem is because of the number of impacts that have been um, placed upon those irrigators in terms of financing right now. So the reason why we um, have not gone out for uh, additional bonds or loans is because there's a perception, there's almost certainty that we, we would not be able to get that by um, because increasing the debt that our irrigators are uh, already experiencing after epic drought and production uh, levels being so low, um, high inflation rates uh, that uh, many of us have not seen, increased production costs, 
with um, fertilizers and even the costs of the water that they have, you know, our costs go up too. And so for us to burden the, the producers with additional um, uh, fees and, and assessments, uh, we're to the point now where we could uh, potentially be shooting ourselves in the foot. I don't know if I answered your question fully, but um, that's the best I can. That's, help, that's helpful. Thanks. Yes. There, there's like a there's a there's a number there. There's a twenty five thousand dollar limit or one third of the um, average of the last three years of your OM budget, and so that uh, loan that we took out was because that's the limit that that our attorney um, has said that's that's where you if you don't want to go out for a vote before it goes to a vote. Yes. And do we have any of the landowners in the on the district online? Or there's there's no no landowners in the room, right? Roy Buyer is on the line. Roy, could we put you on the spot to sort of give some perspective on that same question? Yes, I'm trying to. Uh, so yeah, this is Roy Buyer. Um, my wife Mary and I we own the Wind Down Ranch, which is. Um, if you look at Micaiah Creek, we're the uppermost private landowners on Micaiah Creek. So Micaiah Creek comes out of the National Forest. We have the first draw um, on it for our 34 acres of water rights. We've had this property since 1996. And uh, it's just, I guess it's always been a real challenge Um for us as livestock producers and hay growers to really because of the in-stream water rights and we're so dependent on mother nature um three years ago we didn't even get a real first cutting we don't ever get a second cutting because the water is not available and so it would be a a real benefit to the landowners up here that irrigate off of Mackay creek to have that pressurized water and delivery, you know, for the full irrigation season of the OID district. And uh, so that's, that's, you know, to have that guaranteed water, if the, if the district has the water based on the reservoir storage, then, you know, we would have that water too. So um, it is a real, would be a real benefit to the landowners up on Mackay Creek that are above the irrigation district now to, to have some stability and reliability and knowing that they're going to be able to, you know, produce enough hay crops for their livestock. And the other part I would like to, is the, our, Mackay Creek was channelized heavily in the early mid sixties. Um, so it's just kind of a raceway through our place, but we, We've never, we like to do some riparian repair projects in the upper reaches just to kind of put some more sinuosity back in that stream bed and, and uh, make it look more natural and, and actually probably get some natural, you know, rehydration of the floodplain. Um, but we just, you know, we're so unsure of what we got, we just have failed to um embrace that you know we're at a workable but project but that's something that we'd like to do if we can get some reliable water outside the, the the creek so uh anyway i guess i would just urge that this commission could you know provide the funds that we that oid and disuse rivers conservancy could complete this project this has been 18 years or more that I've been involved in discussions with Kate. And, uh, you know, I think it's, uh, if we don't do it now, as, as Bruce and they've said, I think with the inflation rate, you know, the, the time might pass. And so I urge you guys to approve the funding if you can. Thank you. And I don't know if you, if I answered any questions. I was just curious on that last bit as a member of the district. Well, you would become a member member of the district because you're not currently served by it. Um, That's but correct. as a producer, as a producer, what are your thoughts on the prospect of taking on some, you know, some skin in the game debt associated with this, particularly if it's forgivable debt tied to some of that riparian sinuosity work you're you're interested in? Well, the the problem is because we're typically, you know, traditionally flood irrigated. So it is already a big, going to be a big infrastructure 
commitment on our part to put in, you know, wheel lines and pivots. And so I don't, I don't see where I'd be willing to accept any more debt as an OID patron, you know, and I, I think if the people that are up here, that are doing that, if, if that to become a member of OID and you all of a sudden you got, uh, you know, some debt payment that comes with it, um, you know, I think a lot of them are opt not to join the project. They don't have to join it. And if there's going to be more costs involved than just even infrastructure to get, you know, to, to put out the pressurized water, I, I don't think it would fly. I think uh, Bruce is right. I think we're at a tipping point, you know, where we there's already going to be a lot of costs to the people that are joining the district. So any more debt, forgivable or not, I don't think it would be swallowable. I don't think it, it would go. Thank you. Bruce can ask one follow-up question to that. In the application, it said that on net, um, the net benefit increase for three hay crops across these 17 landowners is $248,000. Is that net of the investment in the hard infrastructure that Roy, that, uh, Roy was just returned to? I believe that's referring to um, crop production increases that uh, currently, for example, Roy gets one cutting. Right. Um, and, and so they, they typically run out of water in July, right? And, and, um, and the, the stream grows dry. And, and, and with the uh, reliable irrigation water stored in Prineville Reservoir, our irrigation season usually goes till October. But, but my, my question is when, it, when I see something on net, um, it's on net of expenses usually. And I'm, I'm just curious if in that calculation, you all were calculating what it was gonna cost these 17 landowners to convert to center pivot or whatever other hard infrastructure, or if it was just a, a grossed up what you get on net currently times two or plus yeah times two. Yeah, Commissioner, well, I, I, I don't recall what that number, how we arrived at that number specifically, whether or not inputs were associated with that um, and whether or not the, uh, or we just said, well, they'll get at least two more cuttings. Thank you. Very apologetical. No, no, thanks. No more questions. Thank you. No more questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Steve Forrester, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and members of the commission. Uh, for the record, my name is Steve Forrester. I am a city manager of Primeville. Uh, I'm also an OID board member, which irrigation district board member. I failed to mention I'm also on Kate's board or DRC. And, and I am a farmer. So this morning at 5.30, I went out to my farm and uh, I had a flat tire on my pivot. So I was in a really bad mood, but traveling over here with Bruce and getting to talk to you, I'm happy, happy, happy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna kind of back clean up here for the three previous uh, presenters regarding the Mackay switch. Um, sir, your, your question recently on our ability to pay debt to put things in perspective, you know, a $1 uh, increase in our assessment is $20,000, give or take. So you can see that we are a little bit constrained. We are one of the higher uh, costs uh, per acre uh, irrigation districts in the region uh, because of our sensitivity to all the pumps we have to use to lift the water. So I just wanted to make that comment. I also wanted to, to speak to uh, the community and the culture in Prineville. Um, in 2007, it was mentioned earlier, we had the reintroduction of the salmon into our, into our Crooked River Basin. The city got to work, and we are members of the HCP, which is quite unusual. I don't think we might be the only city in the nation that is part of an HCP process that has been successful. And uh, I think that speaks volumes, and I, I, I want you to be uh, aware of that in terms of, of the commitment that the community of Prineville and the county of Crook have put into this project. We went to work on that with an eye on the conditions that we were living in in the high desert and semi-arid climate. We also recognized that we needed to rethink how we manage the water, stored water behind Bowman Dam. We knew that it was only half allocated in terms of its capacity. We knew there was environmental concerns on the reintroduction and the stream flows on the crooked. Uh, we worked very hard, very tirelessly with a variety of different interests. It was a, a big hill to climb. Uh, I'm sure not everybody's happy, 
but we did come up with a solution that was signed into law with the Crooked River Act in 2014 by President Obama. And we had a lot of partners across a variety of interests that allowed that to be possible. To further that commitment, the city of Prineville, along with partners such as the Oaks Irrigation District and County of Crook, we worked on a lot of different, what I would characterize as environmental stewardship ideas that have been implemented and put in play. A good example of that is the Crooked River Wetland Project, where we do not mechanically treat water. We use popular lagoons. We treat the water for bacteria. We put it into a wetland that has become nationally recognized with the Pisces Award from DEQ that was presented to the city uh, in Washington, D.C. several years ago. And the beauty of that project is it's not only a place for people to go watch birds and things like that. There's a series of wetlands and side channels that are now areas where smoke are, are introduced uh, as part of the reintroduction of the salmon. And coincidentally, it's very close to the Deschutes Land Conservancy's uh, confluence of Mackay Creek, Ochoco Creek, and Crooked River. In fact, it's right across the Crooked River from it. So we work in collaborate, collaboration with, with all those different interests that we will enhance that area for the environment and obviously the reintroduction. My point in saying some of these things is this is an investment by the community and a partnership with all members of the governing bodies of that community. Our taxpayers have put many, many dollars, and I, I, I hesitate to think what it is, but it's in the millions, to become part of the HCP, to get consultation, to work with the different agencies the Crooked River Act possible. And all those things were foundational to come here before you today and make this ask. If we didn't have the Crooked River legislation with the 2,740 acre feet uh, allocated to Mackay for this purpose, we wouldn't be here today. If we weren't successful in our new pump station that just got turned on this spring that's delivering water effectively and more efficiently to the farmers in our basin, our patrons, we would not be here today. Had the city and OID not partnered on the just recently awarded uh, piping and road project that goes through Iron Horse, we call it, as Bruce said, the Iron Horse project, and that did get passed. It is within budget. We have a very qualified construction company to work with that. The city's provided engineering. Our taxpayers have supported that. Our city council has supported that. We would not be here today. So this collaborative work and Prineville really transitioning to a leader, uh, I shouldn't say Prine, but Crook County community has, has transitioned to a leader in environmental stewardship in our region is quite remarkable. I'm very proud of that. I came from the forest products industry. I'm very sensitive to um, trying to find even ground and sustainable practices to try to have our cake and eat it too, to, to whatever degree that's practicable in terms of meeting the needs of not only industry, in this case, agriculture, and our stewardship of the environment, which is extremely important. And we have that commitment in our community and it, wants to, it needs to continue with the Mackay switch. And I just can't uh, imagine um, being in a situation and having a decision point that you all have right now that could be any better. Uh, we are ahead of the game. I'm very sensitive also, and we all are onto others that have very good projects, but we are on the cusp of completing something that's been in the works for about 20 plus years. And I see Kimberly Priestley back there, and I know she can, she can vouch for some of the things I've said that, we, that uh, allowed us to um, get to the point that we're at today, and that just a whole lot of people have worked tirelessly to make this possible. So I ask the, the commission to bring to bear your experiences and the weight of, of the enormity of this project and what it means to the environment, what it means to the farming community, and hopefully uh, award us some extra funds to uh, make this uh, Mackay switch possible. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Mr. Wolf. <clears throat> yes, um, yeah, as, as an agricultural producer myself, who's uh, went through a 
Any patient any tire problem recently? What's that? Any vivid tire problem recently? Not yet this year. Not, not yet this year, but I have a couple that are just randomly shutting off. Okay. Um, you know, you have pressure transducers that read 30 pounds more than the physical pressure gauge. And, yeah. and so, but related to that, um, I could, I could really see why the producers would not want to take on any more debt because they're signing up for it. Right. Um, they need to, to do this in order to make their water create them more, but they will need that increase in money for operation and maintenance and inflation. And if you're a hay producer, um, your costs are still going up, but your product's worth about half what it was two years ago. And um, so I was just wondering, you know, what the discussion around, you know, stepping up and how, how difficult has it been to get some of the producers on board to switch from flood to pressurization over time? Um, I, I, I got to give some credit to Kate uh, and, and Nastasha for managing the uh, in negotiating with those landowners on Mackay in particular. I can only say from my understanding, uh, that was a very difficult process. Uh, there's a lot of people that don't want to change. We, it, it's really interesting you bring that up because we do have a shift, I mentioned culture, where we have a lot of, in Prineville, we're far enough away that, you know, we haven't felt the full impact of, of uh, although we're feeling it now, but uh, of, transition in terms of ownership of, of these properties, these agriculture properties. So we still have a lot of generational people that are farming in our in our basin and very, very change resistant, um, not very interested in uh, some of these programs and processes. Um, but we've, we've turned that corner, in my opinion, and we have a lot of younger generation uh, uh, of kids who've maybe uh, taken advantage and gone off to college and come back and are implementing some new techniques and some modernization to how they farm. And to answer that question shortly, it was a very steep hill that we climbed with our patrons. And even within the board, uh, you know, we, I, I'm kind of the, the newest person on the board. I am kind of uh, am the newest person and bringing some of these ideas and, with the recognition that we have to move our assessments up to make some of these things possible, for example, our consultants and our legal team uh, to get through some of these processes was a huge challenge for us. And um, being able to complete this, I think, would be a super win, not only for the environment and not only for uh, our patrons, but for our our community in Central Oregon and the rest of the state. So I think I'm, I'm probably going a long way around the barn answering the question, but I do see a shift where I would characterize our patrons are more open to continue modernization and putting more uh, sensitivity on uh, taking care of the environment. Thank you. Question. Thank you, Commissioner Lee. Yeah, um, I'm thinking when you were discussing debt that once the two pump stations are running, your maintenance costs will go up significantly have you looked at some kind of an estimated number on that? Yeah, yeah, we have. Uh, we've been very, um, I, I, I guess, proactive in, in anticipating uh, some of those costs. Some obviously are unknown till they till they get here. But yes, um, the, in the budgeting process, uh, Bruce and his staff, along with our with our board, are anticipating some of those costs, and we're trying to be sensitive to our patrons' costs, especially in the market we're in right now. But um, yes, we, we are prepared to take those on. Any more questions? Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Chris Gannon. Yes, good morning, commissioners, staff, participating interested parties. My name is Chris Gannon for the record. I'm the director of the Crooked River Watershed Council. Uh, we submitted a record, or uh, rather a letter to you on the Mackay topic. Um, we are part of a large collaborative and have been for a long, long time in the basin. We do a lot of conservation work with the DRC, with the Land Trust, and other similar partners. Um, I wanted to point out three uh, points in addition to the points I made in the letter. I'll try to be quick and kind of save some time. Um, I would just point out that this is a really unique opportunity the Mackay Water Switch in Oregon, because I don't know that there are a lot of opportunities where we have unallocated storage 
uh, water, stored water behind a reservoir that we can actually access to make something like a water switch project even work. So I just wanted to point that out. Very, very rare and unique opportunity. Um, in terms of opportunity, there's also opportunity costs associated with big, big projects like Mackay Water Switch. And in our case, those opportunity costs um, relate to other conservation work that we could do. So I just wanted to point out that our collaboration, our collaborative group has already dedicated over $2 million to this project, and that was probably six years ago. So in that context, for the last six years, we have preserved and set aside about two and a half million dollars for this project that we could have been spending on other important conservation work. I think it just goes to the dedication and commitment that all of us have made to this project. And as you've heard from others, it's a it's about a 20 year period of dedication. I guess the third thing I want to say and the last thing I'd want to say is relative to lower crooked below the two regulating uh, dams in the system, the Makai water switch arguably is the second most important conservation project that, that we probably will ever do, short of getting passage past Bowman and Ochico dams. I say that because the first most important project we did in the Lower Crooked was a fish ladder at the very bottom of the watershed at Opal Springs. Uh, without that ladder and passage provided by that ladder, of course, projects like the Mackay Water Switch or even the Ochico Preserve really would have limited um, benefits for steelhead and salmon because they just can't get to those sites without the fish ladder at Opal. So that Opal Springs ladder um, was over $12 million in total investment. We were also a partner in that project of about $2 million. Um, now we have steelhead and salmon that can access the watershed. Uh, that has sort of put more pressure, if you will, more conservation pressure on getting other work done in a timely fashion. So I just wanted to emphasize the timing of the Mackay water switch. Uh, I don't know that uh, without additional funding and without uh, maintaining the momentum for the project as to whether it will really um, provide the benefits that we all hope for. Uh, thank you very much for, for the opportunity to provide comments. Thank you. Are there any questions for Chris? Okay, that concludes all of our public comment that is signed up. Any further commission discussion? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can start the discussion by making a, a motion, actually. I, I would actually like to move that we fund all of the applications that were submitted this round for the new pot of money in the process, increasing the social cultural cost, uh, I'm sorry, score assigned to the joint system canal piping project phase one from a six to a seven. So it gets it over the line. And similarly, increasing the Snake River pumping efficiencies environmental score from a six to a seven. So it gets it over the line. So now all of the applications have met that minimum seven across all three. Um, we fund those out of the $50 million package and we table the Mackay Creek until tomorrow's commissioner comments time. And in lieu of commissioner comments, we revisit and make a decision on that tomorrow to give us today to learn more about the Deschutes Basin and, and think about this. We documented that motion. Someone repeat that. I wanted to second that until you threw in the tabling. <laughs> I, I, I was on the same page there with, uh, the, yeah. with you, Meg. The, the first part I, I'm on board with. Absolutely. You understand my tabling is just so yeah, hard. So, just so we have more time okay. to. Just, just a little more. You know, we've got, we've got 45 minutes of commission comment time. I think people really. I mean, no offense to any of us, but I think they'd much rather have us deliberate on something like this than give comments. Chair Quems, commissioners, um, just a couple things from a logistical standpoint. Uh, so if commissioners want more time to think on it by themselves, that's great. Just as a reminder, though, you can't talk among each other about the projects. And we'd also ask that this is the forum for the public to provide a comment on the record. And so while we will be going on a tour today, really we'd ask that everybody's comments come in through this agenda item. So just two things from a, a technical standpoint to be mindful of. 
And can I just ask about that, Raquel? Because technically, while the meeting is open, it's public. So we can technically talk about it while we're in the public meeting and the tour is also public. So technically we could still talk about it during the tour. We just couldn't do successive comments afterwards or over dinner or tonight or anything like that. Is that, is that my understanding correct? Well, the, the tour is not recorded, right? And so I think we should be mindful of that. It is noticed, but um, it's not recorded and it's not part of any follow-up record that folks could have. Um, so no, commissioners could not go out, out on the tour. This is not what you're asking, by the way. But to be real clear, yeah. the commissioners could not go on the tour and talk amongst each other about this project, right? For, for sure. Um, if we were to record those conversations and provide them as part of the record. Which we are not going to do because I can't do that from a living. Put it here on the phone and post it to somebody. Uh, Chair Clems. Real quick, just one other thing. I've been talking with Doug briefly. Um, we do have a plan here in terms of speeding a couple agenda, removing a couple agenda items because they're more informational. Um, so we are happy to kind of get us back on schedule by cutting a couple items. Um, so just note if that's the reason, um, we do wanna make sure you all have time to deliberate. We also know we have external folks coming here to present to all of you um, for one of the agenda items. Uh, which of course I have looked over. So agenda item E, and in that, of course, we'll want to make sure that we uh, accommodate those folks who will be joining the commission. So we'll pull the staff items off. A question. Sure, I, I get a sort of question for Joe. Um, what do you think about before we table this decision, trying to get a sense of whether we are all on the same page already about this decision on the on the Mackay Creek project? I mean, whether we need the extra time. I yeah. I I would be prepared to support the four million. Oh, we do have a difference. As a grant. As a grant. Yeah. Commissioner Lee. Yeah, I have a question about the total funds because when I look at option six, that would cost twenty six four forty. And I think we have Funds that go up to 27,872 with the 2.7 that's been returned. Um, so, is that a correct number? Chair Quimps, uh, commissioners, the reason I'm sitting here is because I'm actually going to say, oh, Kim Ogren <laughs> uh, can respond to that. I don't know if Kim heard it, but her hand is also up. So, um, Kim, I'm going to direct it back to you. Yeah, Chair Quimps, uh, members of the commission, in terms of uh, a couple of things in fund availability. So there is just under $25 million sitting in the account unobligated for irrigation modernization funding. And then about 7.7 .7 million available in water project grants and loans, which is a total of around 29 million and change. Adair, it looks like, is looking up to get the exact number. Um, yeah. And I will also note if you, if the commission is interested in funding all 10 irrigation modernization projects, they are all listed in attachment two. And the total award would be over 25.9 million, which is greater than the 24.9 million available for those funds. So we would, the department would have some questions about who is waiting for the 20, the the next pot of 25 million, or if you're dipping into the water project grants and loans, there's just some logistical pieces. But if you're looking for the full list and an easy recommendation um, in terms of verbiage, attachment two in the staff report has a table of all 10 applications and their funding requests. And then I wanted to add on to that, my comment that I would like to see all the projects funded, but if we're going to table the Mackay discussion until tomorrow, I'd like to see everything tabled and dealt with at once. Oh, that's well, Commissioner Mall's motion didn't receive an actual second. Um, we have a question about the ability to discuss this during the tour. I think even if we're not discussing it during the tour, people are learning about the basin, hopefully. And um, but we don't have a valid motion at the moment. 
Chair Quems, commissioners, um, one of the reasons this is the very first agenda item, and so this is the merits of this thought process is up to all of you, um, but we wanted to provide everybody, so folks in the Deschutes Basin, as well as folks that are around the state, the same opportunity to access the commission and provide their comments. And so just um, knowing, I know folks wanna learn more about the basin, maybe that'll inform your decision and maybe that's a good thing, um, but just note that the reason we put this first was to give everybody the same opportunity to influence the commission's decision on this. So that's up to you all as to whether or not that's good or bad idea. Sure. Uh, yeah. Um, Commissioner Reeves. <laughs> <laughs> we have a running joke. <laughs> um, so just to clarify, Kim, the, the funds that are available to us in our discretion to to distribute in this meeting. It's the the uh, uh, the modernization funds, 24 point something, I think you mentioned. 24.9. Is, is that like a hard stop or was that kind of an administrative decision going into this? Could we could we allocate more than that from those funds? Yeah, Chair Quimps, Commissioner Reeves, you can <laughs> allocate more. How we've handled it in the past is a provisional award. Uh, okay. The department and I think grantees uh, prefer and really try to avoid at all costs entering into a grant agreement. Well, in DOJ might not even approve for legal efficient, sufficiency, a grant agreement for funds that are not present. There's some legal, okay. legal risk associated with that. That would wait for a bond sale, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it would, uh, how we've handled it in the past is there. Uh, were some grants that were an immediate award, they got their grant agreements, you know, in the next month or so to sign. Uh, and then there were other grants that had provisional awards contingent on the bond sale. And once the bond sale went through, they got their grant agreements, but they had an award letter in hand, they just didn't have access to the okay. money. And then on the water project grants and loans, we have 7.7 .7 million available to distribute right now, correct? correct? Is that right? Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. So wouldn't that be 31.7 and some change collectively? Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> so that could put us about a million, a little over a million short of if we were to choose to fund everything. Right. Well, it would leave us a million Committed, but not available. Correct. No cash on hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, if, if we, if people are comfortable with having more discussion time, I can certainly elaborate on um, why I want more time to think about it. I think uh, there's um, Yancey Lind is on the line. I don't know Yancey. I've never met him, but I read his article in the paper after our award. Mackay Creek last time. And it was really a sound assessment that, my God, we are boxing ourselves into some corners when it comes to how much money we're spending to address challenges that we all have. And as soon as this agenda item is over, we're going to get into groundwater and we're going to get in the same position. Of how did we get ourselves into this position? And so being thoughtful about the range of public benefits, aside from the scoring, but long-term public benefits we're getting with investment is why I just have, on one hand, an interest in seeing money go out to all of the projects that have come in. On the other hand, thinking, wait a minute, who, who's benefiting from, from some of these things and, and how do we identify that? And to me, having, you know, we, many of the comment letters, especially from the in-stream water folks, are adamant that any money that goes out the door has to have guaranteed in stream. Um, and so we find people putting round pegs in the square holes uh, to try to articulate in the grant application what that looks like when everybody's just trying to figure it out on the ground and getting money out there in good faith to work together as you've done here and as everyone is doing in different ways around the state, I think is important. And us being in the position of saying, uh, 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 because of this grant agreement, you should do this and not that. I just don't think it's functioning very well in Oregon right now. 
And so getting money out the door in my mind is great, but being cognizant of, wait a minute, big picture. I mean, you know, if, if you do the, if you do the math on the, the net benefit that these 17 landowners are going to, you know, that was a big part of the application. If you do the math on that, if you invested about $10 million now in the market and got a post-inflation three and a half percent return rate, you could afford to pay all of those landowners in cash forever the amount of money they're going to net as it's calculated. Now that does that doesn't get it all to the cultural side of things, I know, but from a from a public dollar standpoint, it's a, a for a third of the cost, you could pay everybody what they would net, not having to mess with any in, in, in irrigation equipment, and you could do the restoration on the ground and get that flood clean sinuosity back. And do we want to design things for a community like that? No, we don't want to do that. But you see that kind of stuff happening, and, and we, want, we want to encourage that. So I feel like getting money out there, but also with the encouragement to, hey, look, let's think about this long, long term. I mean, 50 years from now, is it, is it going to be the same? Is this, what, how's this infrastructure going to be used 20 years from now, 50 years from now? Is it, is, it, is it something that the city of Prineville could tap into for drinking water at some point? Hell, I don't know. That's why I feel like learning more about the whole basin and thinking about it will help us. So again, I uh, appreciate the discussion. I want to note that the, the motion didn't receive a second. Uh, Commissioner Lee had an alternate motion to table it, but table the whole package. And I think if we did that, we would also have the opportunity for staff to put together the numbers clearly for us. Um, you mean the numbers of available dollars? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So is there some motion? I'll, I'll that withdraw effect? my motion. Then my my whatever that was. <laughs> <laughs> That's statement. <laughs> Yeah, I'm happy to second tabling them all if that if, if the rest of the commissioners would agree to that. But I, Commissioner Lee, did you want to make a motion? That's what everyone else is yeah. comfortable with. I I'm okay with that, but kind of want to make a decision today. <laughs> I just want to get it. We're fully prepared to make a decision if we have to. Would we be taking public comment on this again tomorrow? I'm just thinking about the people who are here and whether they have to come back tomorrow as part of that. Well, it, it is interesting, your comments on investing the money and gaining a three and a half percent return. But I, I think I think the the real key is to focus on getting it out there and, and seeing what leverage it can create on an economic driver in the community and, a, and an environmental return on seeing those stream flows come back. And I don't don't know that that's as tangible as, as your figures of the three and a half percent return, which as of recent has not been keeping up with inflation. So it would be a diminishing rate of return. That's post inflation. Sorry, <laughs> post inflation, three and a half percent. Part of the benefit, I think it's not just to the community or to the county. I think it's an example to the whole state of what can be done when you work together collaboratively, even though it takes 20 years uh, or so. so. That's that's what some of this takes. Um, and so, you know, I see it as a good example to not only Prideville and the community and the county, but also to other counties throughout the state. Sure, that's Kim Frisco from County. Sorry. Apologies, Chair Crumbs. I uh, was just wondering if there was any specific information that the department or others could provide to the commission to help with a decision for today or tomorrow. Like if, if there is this tabling and we know that there can't be conversation off the record, um, is there something that the department can do to help? Thank you, Kim. I think we need to see the numbers very clearly about what's available. There were some questions from Chair Reeves about that. You know, what are the options? Um, without having that in front of us in writing, I think that needs to be clarified for the commission. I would also like to see some sort of uh, estimated figures on, you know, uh, if we spent all this money, the remainder relative to prospective future demand 
for these funding pools? What the balance is for the second well, cycle? Yeah, what the balance is for the second cycle and then what the expected anticipated demand for that money is, if that's possible. When is the second cycle? Is it for tomorrow? Kim, can you go ahead and I, I don't believe we'll know the demand, although I did hear that there was maybe a, a couple folks that have already been in contact with our staff. So Kim and Adair, can maybe one of you respond to the question of what we know about future applicants? I suspect that actually April Snell may know this more than we do, but um, so not to call April out, but if you would like to also come up here and comment on that. And then, um, sorry, what was the other question that I just heard that I don't know? A second. And, and second. Kim and Adair, if you could go through the, um, just the timeline for the next uh, funding cycle, that would be appreciated as well. I believe we're accepting applications what through July and then the decision is, would be at the December meeting, I believe, but. Sure, please. We're work to start in fall of 25. Kim, did you get that? I did not get that last piece of fall, something before fall of 2025. So when the next cycle is and when the decision would be made and then what we anticipate in terms of demand is the questions. Thanks, I can answer some of that now um, and then agree that part of the information that I would provide in writing is something that April has already shared and she may have more updated numbers. But the application deadline closes July 10th. I guess the of this year, and we would come for funding decisions at the December commission meeting. There is currently $32,672,118 available for award today. And then in terms of future demand, uh, I believe the last number that we had for irrigation modernization was about 25, 26 million, um, though I would defer to the districts. And those numbers change a lot because of in inflation and stuff. And then Adair, um, in your conversations with the five potential water project grant and loan applicants, have those included uh, rough dollar amounts uh, to date, or sometimes folks are just telling us about their project and they haven't finalized their uh, their dollar ask. Yeah, thanks, Kim. Just one other question about the money. Um, are there projects that are currently in the block of money for the modernization that could be moved over to the seven million, whatever is in the other fund, so that we could fund everything? The grants and loans. Commissioner I mean, Weinberg, all of the funds are in the water supply development account. And mm -hmm. because of how we ran the irrigation modernization, they are all eligible for water project grants and loans. Okay. Hey, and this is Doug. I have a question about the seven and a half million under water projects, grants, and loans. We have another funding cycle for 2024 that will be coming up. Do we want to reserve any of those funds for that second water projects funding cycle? Thanks. Have we thought that through? Thanks, Doug. Yes, uh, we uh, have signaled that there is funding. And when we were planning out the funding cycles, we had intended for there to be 5 million available for all of 2024, including the second funding cycle. And it gets to that sort of uh, projects of diverse types. Irrigation modernization has a limited um, set of types versus water project grants and loans is a broader um, a broader set. And I think we would encourage reserving some funds for water project grants and loans. Oh, Kim, I'm sorry. This is very confusing. I understood that there was 7.7 .7 million kind of available at this point and 5 million reserved for the next water project grants and loans round. Do I so have that wrong? I thought there was 12 point, yeah. Yeah, uh, Commissioner Reeves, another $5 million will be uh, issued in bond sales in the spring of 2025. And so what the commission could do um, if they awarded 
all of what's currently in the account, those December awards would need to be provisional contingent upon the 2025 bond sale. Okay. Chair Quims, would it be helpful for there to walk through the numbers here that are on the screen? <clears throat> and does this help any of you? And if you want me to come up there, I'm happy to do that. Is it tiny? I apologize. I'm not in the room and I can't see what this looks like, but in preparation for this meeting, I have put all of the projects on the left, the applicants, the grant funds they requested, and then what it would look like for alternatives one through six, which are in the staff report. Um, and then I've added alternative seven. The highlights are you decide what goes there. Um, as you were speaking, I added the option that was put on the table to fully fund table four. Um, nope, sorry, I didn't get that there. No, sorry, this option K is fully fund table four and Mackay. This was the option that you put on the table was to fully fund everything. Um, I'll take out that 7.5 because I don't believe I heard that full 7.5. Um, Anyway, all this to say, I can figure these numbers out for you. So if you if you want to fund all 10, that's 25.9 million. Again, we have 24.9 million available. So you could either pull some of that from the 7.7 .7 that's available for water project grants and loans, or you could tap into that uh, second 25 million that will be available next year and do a provisional award say for the last um you know the lowest ranked project could receive a provisional award that would be awarded when that bond sale goes through next year um i'm not sure if please feel free to ask me questions i'm happy to do these calculations as you're talking if that helps thank you adara that's great work very responsive uh, on the fly i appreciate <laughs> it um questions from the commission can we ask questions of the audience still? Of the commenters still? That's still sure. part of the great. Bruce, can you remind us again? You said if the four million were awarded, not the seven and a half, you would be able to move forward, but you wouldn't be able to do the final. Uh, uh, you couldn't deliver water to the 17 landowners, is what I heard, because you couldn't put that last pump in. Is that correct? Correct. If we were to do that and you were still looking for three and a half million, what would can you, do you what, what plan B's you are thinking about now? Are there other funding sources or could we do a four million? What would a three and a half million dollar loan feel like, for example? For um for us and the communication that we've had, and I'll just acknowledge the work that that, that Adair and, and Kim have done. It's been fabulous um, because we're very fortunate. Um, the uh, the four million that uh, that the staff has indicated is the uh, the needed to construct the uh, and, and they've allowed us to move the. the the initial four million from the water project grants and loans to construct Brook River Pump Station Number Two, that lifts the water from the the uh, Crook River Distribution Canal into the Ochoco Main Canal to get it to the point of delivery where we could be, begin to lift it to the Mackay landowners. Obviously, we wouldn't want to build the Mackay pump and pipeline before we can get the water there. Yeah, sure. so we have to we have a it's a sequence process, right? So the additional four million is needed to do the pump station, and then the three and a half million dollar gap is still present, and then we would have to go after other sources. Um, we don't know for sure what those are. Um, we we definitely have been pursuing that, and I'll let Kate discuss about um, <laughs> where where we are looking. But there are definite other sources that we would try, but it will delay the project. It, it will extend it at least one more year um, beyond where we're at right now. And the prospect of a three and a half million dollar loan on top of a four million dollar additional grant, does that sit any better in your mind with whether or not the, uh, the association would either go for it or is there some other creative way that the city of Prineville could hold that three and a half million dollar forgivable loan or I, I appreciate the question, and I don't know, sir. I, I it's not something that we have, as I said, we haven't entertained the, the ability to go out for a loan 
without vote uh, of the district. So, are you asking if the city is going to write the bond? Yeah, I mean, you know, from a state perspective, is that possible? Do you think something like that would be possible? Yeah, yeah. certainly. No, yeah. Yeah. Raquel next, and then Commissioner Wolf and Commissioner Smitherman. Uh, Chair Crumbs, Commissioners, uh, I don't know that I've put my name on the record yet today. For the record, Raquel Rancier, Deputy Director, um, I just want to note that uh, we cannot make a decision on a loan today. So if that is a interest of the commission, that would need to come back. Um, there's specific standards that need to be met and evaluated before a loan could be approved. And so just note if that is something that is of interest that has to come back to the commission on another day. We can give money away, but we cannot give a loan. <laughs> is that what I'm hearing? Chair Clem's commission, there's specific standards in the rules that require us to you know, present that information and evaluate it for a loan that's different than the grants. Since no one had applied for a loan, those standards haven't been applied today. And that's why we don't have that information for you today to be able to evaluate that. Thank Commissioner you. I Wolf. Meant no disrespect, Raquel. I'm sorry. I didn't respond. Um, yeah. Bruce, would you have any uh, idea of, of a metric on, like, for every million dollars you would borrow, what that would translate into um, rate increases per acre, per acre foot of water? I mean, just correlate what a loan does to the cost of the producer in well, some manner. I can do my best. As, as uh, Mr. Forster already mentioned, uh, we raise our assessment one dollar. That's a one dollar per acre increase to their assessment uh, to our patrons. That earns twenty thousand dollars to the uh, operating budget for the irrigation district to fund uh, three and a half million dollars um, over a period of time. Um, that's a lot of math, and I'm not good at math. <laughs> I don't need to be facetious, but it's a lot. I mean, it's it's, it's a major. Right, you'd, you'd be several dollars a month. So you're looking at twenty to thirty dollars a year per acre, which what and their current assessment is is sixty nine dollars. Yeah, so you would be a thirty to fifty percent increase in your assessment, which is too much. <laughs> Yes. I, I guess I, I just and I it's probably in the in the documents, but those 17 customers that you're trying to get online, where are they pulling their water from now? Directly from the direct, directly from yeah, they are the direct diverters. They have I, natural flow water rights and they pull it out of the creek. That's what I just wanted to clarify. Okay. And so by putting them on this system, they will no longer be pulling water out of Mackay Creek. Mackay Creek will flow, hopefully longer into the season, into October, into the rainy season, and the, those 17 irrigators along with the rest of your irrigators will pull out of the lake. Or you will, that will be the source of the water. There's, they will go from natural flow water rights to stored water, stored water. delivered through a pipeline, through pressurized system, decreases their pumping uh, costs, uh, uh, <laughs> and pressurizes the water to, to sprinkle instead of flood irrigating in, in many circumstances. And additionally, it adds uh, that 2,740 uh, acre feet of water to the hydrograph. So we're not only restoring the natural hydrograph, we're actually adding additional water to the hydrograph to, uh, to make impacts to that. And, and uh, what, what, you, what you may not have been, been uh, privy to is the amount of on-farm efficiencies that are going on. The uh, plan that the Watershed Council has for uh, improved riparian uh, habitat along the, the those stretches. So there, is, over the last twenty years, there's a whole lot of, of um, conversations and improvements that have been going. Okay, and thank so you. would the live flow diversions be removed since they're no longer needed? Yes, that's that's requirement for it. So. Uh, no, there would be no fish passage obstructions through the entire stretch of Mackay Creek. The first six miles is found within the irrigation district, and the irrigation district has already moved all of those fish barriers. The next six miles until the National Forest boundary is what we're talking about improving right now, and all of those barriers would then be removed. Kate? Okay. So I just wanted to, to complete the answer to the question about, you know, thinking about how we come up with the other three and a half million. And even if we were 
to come up with that or you know get a loan or whatnot. Um, one of the risks that would delay the project for another year. We currently have OF funding from a focused investment partnership that we received about 10 years ago that they have been very, very patient with us. We are currently extending that to 25, 26, and that is the last extension of that grant. So we risk actually losing two and a half million dollars if we have to delay the project one more year. Helpful. Commissioner Reeves. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to get a sense from the commission. Well, I think we have the option, if I'm getting these numbers right, of funding all 10 of these projects and funding seven and a half million with some of that, with the last part of that seven and a half million being provisional on the next bond sale. Mm -hmm. I mean, not provisional, I guess, have to wait for yeah. disbursement until the next bond sale. I guess I'd like to clarify whether that is accurate, and if so, whether there's interest. If is that a non-starter for the commission, or and if that's the case, are you still in jeopardy of losing the two point five from from OWEB? That would keep the project on track, so the timeline would be good. And if we didn't receive a portion of those funds until the spring, that would still be fine as long as we got at least four million. Yeah, at least four million. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Chair Quam's commissioners, um, that is an option. Certainly, that if the commission wants to do, you know, a portion is a provisional award for the next bond sale. That is another option. I do want to note for the chair because I can see Commissioner Kahara, but I don't know if uh, our chair can. That uh, Commissioner Kahara's hand up is up as well. Oh, good. Okay. Um, another number that I've seen in the report is to fund the Mackay at four point nine million. What does that do for the project? The point nine. Yeah, the four. Yeah, the uh, you know, the, rather than four million, I see in here there's a four point nine million. But where did that number come from? Is uh, that helpful? Inflation. What? Why is it different? Why is it? Yeah, why, is it different? Yeah. <laughs> why, why are we not talking we about have, that? We have a couple options: either four million, four point nine million, or seven point five million. Yeah, um, I believe the staff came up with that number because it, it actually equals the inflationary cost. So that was just another data point. Okay. Um, it would put us in the same position as if we received the $4 million, but we would have $0.9 million less to make up, but it would still put us in the position of delaying the project and putting the public at risk. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful to clarify. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Mr. Mole, Mole. Uh, <laughs> one of the things I'm perceiving from some of your the line of questioning that you have, which thank you very much for, is you know what's what's the skin in the game? Patrons, am I correct in that assumption? There's a piece of that, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, so one of the things I want to point out is, is part of the HCP agreement and the law. Um, we uh, our patrons are investing. It's not huge, but it's the twenty five dollars a account. Uh, we assess to our patrons, and that goes directly into you know conservation projects and uh, other other things like that. In addition to that, the community, back to my collaborative uh, aspect to Prineville, Cook County, and OID, like that um, you know, as we go through these processes, we have legal costs, we have consulting costs. We've been very proactive, and let me give an example. Um, within this whole process is. You know, we also have hired uh, Mount Hood Consultants, uh, did I speak that name right? Was, uh, environmental um, environmental um, to start, uh, and they, we're investing in that significant amount of dollars into be proactive on the nitrates in our system. What we, can, what we can do about them, identify where they're at, where they're coming from, all those kind of things. So I want to impress upon the commission here today is that we do have skin in the game, not only OID and our patrons, but the community at large. So we share a lot of those costs for the consultation for people like Mount Environmental. Legal, legal uh, costs uh, are shared amongst the county, city, no irrigation district, all with the idea that we're in this together and we're affecting everybody. The other thing I just wanted to mention, and I don't know this uh, for sure, but doing some uh, home calculations, which are always very dangerous to understand <laughs> that. Um, I estimate, Bruce, there's what, six, 700 acres of uh, water rided uh, land on the uh, Mackay, the farmers of Mackay. 
uh, you know, being very optimistic, let's say best of times, if you're going uh, uh, a feed product, uh, uh, Timothy grass, alfalfa, least confirm woody. And a, a great year would be five tons an acre. Um, that's about a thousand dollars an acre. So I would estimate we're probably high side a million bucks in total revenue, uh, low side half that. Um, and given today's hay market, it, I don't even want to say the number just makes me mad, but uh, uh, 150 bucks a ton, 200 bucks a ton. That's probably where that 248 came from. So that would be, to, to your point, your question earlier, probably the net profit for uh, farm operations. So I wanted to see if that helped you. No, I, but that's all really helpful. Thank you. And I, and I appreciate this, the, the, you know, driving from the Willamette Valley through sisters in the bend and seeing, understanding the shock that the agricultural community has been going through and will continue to go through, um, makes this all, all of that really relevant. My only concern is, uh, are we continuing to hobble mistake upon mistake? Um, and is it going to come back and bite us in the end? And in general, you know, I'm very supportive of the project. No, of all of these projects. The motion again. Um, it's just a question of, as we have been trying, I mean, from my perspective, the grants and loans program for OWRD has been undersubscribed since its inception. We don't get that many applications. And I think part of it is the application process. I think part of it's the review process. Part of it is many communities have not had the investment and skin in the game that the Deschutes area has had. And so there's that catch up. And I wanna make sure that as we distribute money, we are also sending the signals that are, hey, these are the kind of projects that are right to invest in. And uh, that's where some of the, wait a minute, are we pouring significant money into something that, you know, to, I, I, to I, I, um, uh, it looks like he's signed off now, but the, the landowner who was on earlier, a, a system that's been channelized, that's going to take work to make, to buffer it to, to the stream flow. I mean, the, even the flip side, I hear that Mackay Creek floods pretty heavily now when we get heavier rains. Part of that is because it's been channelized. We know that it comes. And so what can we do? I guess, I guess ultimately I'm, I'm ready to make a, a new motion, but I would like it to come with a smiley face from the commission. <laughs> There's a hell of a lot of money invested in all of you and take this in good faith and think about what you can do in good faith from your own side going forward to make this system, this hydrologic community, riparian floodplain system healthier. And that's going to take a lot more work. And what can we do with this investment as leverage for that? Not to come asking for more money, but to do some in-kind work on riparian buffers, on stream remeanders, on the things that will hold water in the system. I do think the landowning community and the, the irrigation community is in a tremendous position to help affect that without bringing in <clears throat> a new piece of machinery. So that's what... That would be my smiley for me. So I, I move that we approve all of the applications and that we also approve the Makai Creek full uh, request, knowing that some of it will not be, uh, it is not yet obligated, it would be obligated, but not yet available. Okay. Second. But that we do so with <laughs> 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 encouragement and that we take that internally into how we continue to administer and adapt the grants and loans program. Much better motion. Is that a second? I yeah. think actually. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know you were motion, motion to fund all 10 projects plus Makai at the 7.7 .7 level with the understanding that some of that 7.7 .7 comes in the next 7.5 7 5 comes in the next cycle. And seconded by Commissioner Reeves. Yes. So I'll sure, I'm, um, I saw ha Kim's hand go up, so I just want to make sure from a logistics standpoint that there, there we're not. Kim, is is there a question here? Yeah. So I, uh, what I heard Chair Quems confirm is that all funding would come from irrigation modernization funding 
none from water project grants and loans. No. No, I think we have to. Yeah, I think we, did you, I, I was assuming that it would oh, come from water yeah, project grants thought, and loans. Yeah, that would come from part of that 7.7. Yeah. Okay. I didn't think about that as one of the options that we would dip into the next 25 million of the. Yeah, yeah, that's what we were talking about. Uh, so I lost track of that. I, I follow staff lead on that. Dipping into the next round for the next phase, essentially, yeah. of the high project, I think is what yeah. we were talking about. Yeah, I guess one advantage that pulling it all out of the 50 million is that it doesn't have as tight the guidelines. Um, from a review process. My sense is that staff have applied the OWRD grants and loans projects guidelines to that based on an interpretation that's that that is not shared among among all of the community that were involved. So I don't know if that but that's a I staff on that one on where to where to pull the money from. I seems like getting it out of the $50 million, even though only 25 has been bonded the next 25. Is that the same timeline? Yes, they're both in March would be the next bond sale. And why don't we do that? Why don't we amend? Can I amend my motion and let's just pull it all out of the 50 million? Since technically we had no applications to the other pot. Yes. Right. Although technically, since we're amending a Mackay Creek, is that okay? High Creek already has water project grants and loan funding. But technically, Mackay Creek didn't apply for the fifty million. Right, right. And so do we have to pull Mackay Creek out of the other since it was since what we're doing as a commission is amending our earlier award? That is up to the discretion of the commission. Oh, oh. Well, great! Can we so much power today? <laughs> and nicely pull it out of the fifty million. Can we use as much of the seven point seven as is? The grants and loans, or the yeah. seven point five million so cost increase. To, to, what, what we want, what we want, we want to end up with is the. Um, I'm not sure how much money we're talking about. It's, whether it's a three and a half million that Mackay needs for the next, the last phase, to um, be the be funding that can wait until next spring. So we want to grant it now, but let it be available next spring, and so. Whatever mix of whatever mix of funding makes sense for that, then uh, I mean, I think I, I had in mind that some of it would come out of the water project grants and loans because that's what's currently funding it. But that's what I thought. Mr. Well. Quems, uh, commissioners, I let me see if I can summarize what I think I just heard. <laughs> Sucks. Okay. Uh, so I think what I'm hearing <laughs> is that we would the commission would like to fund all ten of the irrigation modernization projects with the last one, the lowest receiving a provisional award because there's not enough money in the account, right, for that. And it's for the March, 2025 bond sale. And then what I'm hearing in terms of the Mackay project is that a portion of the funding will come from water project grants and loans uh, let's say 4 million, since we didn't receive any of this grant cycle, um, that would not be a provisional award. That would, would be from this year's funding. And then the 3.5 million could either come from, would be a provisional award, and it could either be ascribed to uh, water project grants and loans or the irrigation modernization funding, or you could provide us the flexibility to determine that at a later date, once we have the full fund, we would say we're awarding it, but which fund it comes from, we could certainly determine that once we see all the projects in front of us. So we're maximizing funding. None of you said that, but I'm being creative on the spot here. So um, I, I think you just hit you okay, maximize funding, <laughs> but can't really say. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's hard to make that decision without knowing what's coming in the future. I, I hear you on that. Kim, I hope I'm not making you or Adair squirm with my improvisation here, but. Nope, that makes sense, Raquel. Um, and it, it does, it is helpful because we do, based on conversations to date, think we'll get applications ranging between 10 and 15 million in total asks for water project grants and loans this July. So. Part of me feels like the, the 50 million is so extraordinary to April's comment 
and the reality of the IL is that, that we should just pull it all out, pull it all out of there because it, 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 this is an extraordinary thing we're doing. So historically, we can pin it to, yeah, it was an extraordinary thing we did because there was an extraordinary amount of money that came down from the federal government. We pulled it out of there and keep the, the ongoing separate. Don't wish to take out. Right, but because I, I can't, I can't. I, what I'm not hearing is that it's going to be mechanically any different to to do that. Chair uh, Quimps, uh, Commissioner, I guess the question I'd ask you: the four million coming out of water project grants and loans, we have that money now, so that wouldn't have to be a provisional award. We don't have the money right now to put all all of the ten projects plus all of the Mackay project into irrigation modernization funding. So we'd have to do more provisional awards. So you could say, we want, I think to get to your objective, you could say 4 million from water project grants and loans that will be awarded you know, non-provisionally. The 3.5 million would be provisional and would come from irrigation modernization funding. You could also do that option as well. Why not? like five to cover the 4.9 to keep up with the inflation and then 2.5 provisional out of the. That is certainly um, up to you. Just remember, we also have another funding cycle, which we would then, I think if we exhaust, well, I guess we have 7.7. .7, so we'd, we'd still be able to run a cycle, I suppose. That is an option. You have so many options today. <laughs> can we, can, is it enough for the commission to say that we would like all 10 of these and the modernization grants to be approved and funded today. And we want to approve the seven and a half million for Mackay with the understanding that some of it will be um, provisional because they'll be funded in spring. And you all decide which staff, funds staff has, this money staff should staff come from. I think today it would be good to document the provisional piece um, they, they need to know, I think. So, yeah, so I think we need to have that piece locked down. Um, and where it's coming from? Oh, the where it's coming from. Right. I think we can, I think we can get there today, right? Because, because uh, what I've provided you with is the, you know, the 3.5 million, if you want the discretion to figure that out at a later date, knowing that we have to fund it, we can do that, oh. right? In terms of which funding program. Um, but I think we just need to know that direction to, to yeah. Yeah, just the amount. Uh, clarifying question. Um, I thought I heard you say that the the applicant with the lowest score, that money would, would be provisional? That's correct, because we don't have enough money in the fund to cover that one today. So I think, is that um, the Snake River pumping one, yeah. Adair? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's no way around that, no way around that that last, that one of those projects being provisional? I, well, I guess technically we could take it from water project grants and loans. I'm hesitant to do too much when they didn't apply for that. I, I'm hesitant for us to go that far, but I suppose that's an option based on what staff have advised. And that was one of the ones that could apply at this next cycle, come yes. by. Mm -hmm. that they had been talked with. They already talked to Adair about that. Adair, um, is this, did you uh, speak with, is this one of the applicants you have already spoken with? They're on, they're yes. online. Oh, they're online? Thank you, April. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yes, Clancy Flynn is online. Um, well, he was, I'm not sure if he still is, but I did talk to Clancy and he, the Waiheer Nation District um, submitted two applications and he said it if one was to be funded, it worked out well for him because the one that was recommended for funding does need the funding immediately to move forward. The Snake River Pumping Efficiencies Project, which is uh, ranked the lowest, they're still working on securing their federal match. Um, so they do not need the money immediately. And he was planning on resubmitting in the next. Okay. So it's still pending. Yeah, one through It's still pending. Yeah. We should fund with provisional on the 10. Right. And then four million for Micaiah. Oh, yes. Mr. Chair, I withdraw my motions. <laughs> Any motion? If um, if we're if one of those 
the last um, uh, modernization grant is going to be provisional, then um, we could fully fund Mackay now out of water project grants alone, right? We have the funding now for that. Uh, Chair Quem's commission, um, you could fully fund setting a yes, you could fully fund water pro through water project grants and loans. Um, I would note on that that you will um, not have we we probably would not run another cycle of water project grants and loans. Oh, okay. Um, this go round, unless the commission directed us to do it and have all provisional awards. But it's not it's not really relevant to Mackay Creek, whether they get the seven and a half now or they get yeah. four now and three and a half later, that either one would be just as suitable to you. Is that correct statement, Bruce? Um, close. The four million now allows us to go out for those long lead items. Um, the three and a half million in the spring, um, it gives us the knowing that we get the three and a half million in the spring gives us the assurance to be able to make planning and not stick our neck out. So it works. It works. It works. It works. Yeah. It works. Because otherwise, you're buying a product that you, you're not sure you're going to get funding to right. actually right. utilize. And then you say bonds go out in March, but that money's not usually available till closer to May. Is that a accurate or inaccurate statement, Mikkel? Kim, can you uh, get that question? I, do we, I did not. When do we have money in hand? If After the bonds March. are sold in March, we have money in hand in April. Okay, so now we're at mm -hmm. projects one through nine, correct, with four million now to Mackay, three and a half million provisional. Mm -hmm. And were you still planning? Were you planning to fund Project Ten? Is provisional? Yes. Or were you yes. planning to? So they don't have to come back, right? Yeah. Yeah. What I would love to do, and since their funding is still pending, yeah, for federal. I withdrew my. We have no motion on the table, just for the record. Okay. No motion on the table currently. Somebody needs to. I gotta take a third step at it, Joe. <laughs> If I can right. do this, I'll make a motion. Okay. All right. Okay. Here we go. Go for it. <laughs> make a motion to fully fund uh, projects one through nine with project 10 being provisional and to fund for that four million, four million for the Mackay project out of the grants and loans. With three and a half million to be provisional on the irrigation modernization bonds next year. Second. Oh, <laughs> what do you got? Second, Commissioner Wolf. And that's why she's why she's here. What do you got? <laughs> Second. Okay. Second. Okay. okay. Motion from Vice Chair Smitherman, second from uh, Commissioner Wolf. Commissioner Wolf, I'll take a vote, please. Aye. Commissioner Tahara? Aye. Commissioner or Vice Chair Smitherman? Aye. Commissioner Reeve? Aye. Commissioner Aye. Lee? Commissioner Mole? Aye. I vote yes as well. Passes unanimously. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your patience. I, um, I thought that when we had seven alternatives in one hour, we had an ambitious goal on the agenda. Uh, and but to the points from the community and the commissioners, there, there is a great deal of community history and investment in these projects. Um, clearly, we have a commission that doesn't want to just rubber stamp things, and which is difficult to do with seven alternatives anyway. But um, I, I appreciate the, the patience and all the discussion because I think it's worth kind of wrestling with these decisions and trying to make good decisions that benefit the community and the resource and uh, appreciate everybody's patience on this agenda item. Thank you. And we're going to make some adjustments to the agenda. <laughs> Chair Quems, uh, so I think in terms of the agenda, I'm sure a couple folks may need to use the restroom. We can either, we can probably pause maybe for five minutes 
I'll note that for um, the budget and legislative update, I can provide you with a three minute update so we can move along. Um, and Doug, I think on the director's report can provide you with a one minute update. <laughs> and then um, we can, we are going to pull the item of Jeremy and Emily today. They, um, that was an informational update, uh, but they will be with us on the tour. So feel free to ask them a bunch of questions. Um, and if we have time uh, tomorrow, I think Emily will be here. Jeremy, we did not have a 10 tomorrow, but uh, if folks are really intrigued, I suspect though we won't have time tomorrow because we have a pretty full agenda with external folks tomorrow as well. So um, that maybe can help us get back on track if maybe folks on item E are ready to maybe shorten just a little bit. Um, and then I see that we do have um, Bobby here from the tribes and uh, Warm Springs. And so we uh, should be able to stay on track there. You may get to lunch just a little late, but don't worry. It's, I think it's a sack lunch. So if you got to take it with you, that's okay too. Okay. So we'll take a, hopefully a five minute five break, minute please. Break. And reconvene. Thank you.
think we need more people with that front table. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. More here than there. <laughs> but again, we like to be collaborative in the district. <laughs> All right, should we dive in? Okay, well, you ready, Chair? Go, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair Quemson, the Commission. For the record, my name is Emily McCain. I'm a senior water advisor with the department. Uh, OWRD has been supporting scientific evaluation and planning at the basin level in the Deschutes for many years. Um, we'll go through some of the progression of how we got to today in the slides here. OWRD currently supports the Deschutes collaborative efforts in developing a place-based integrated water resources plan. Uh, we do that in several ways through staff capacity in data collection and sharing, participating in collaborative planning discussions uh, at the, both the scientific and policy levels, and supporting the planning process itself as part of our place-based planning program. Um, I'm going to turn it over to these wonderful people up here, uh, and uh, I'll let you all take it from here to share kind of about the Deschutes Basin Water Collaborative and this place-based planning effort in the basin. Thanks. Okay. Well, well, thank you, thank you, Emily, and uh, uh, thank you, Commission, for uh, allowing us to be here today and talk about the collaborative. And welcome to Central Oregon. And uh, we've got a beautiful day today to go out and uh, and go on a tour so and it's good to see some familiar faces on the commission so uh so uh welcome um we're going to start off and uh i'm uh, bobby bruno i'm the uh chair one of the co-chairs of the uh, water collaborative and i'll let bill introduce himself uh, good afternoon or good morning still uh my name is phil chang i am one of uh, three county commissioners here in deschutes county and uh, one of the one of the co-chairs of the Deschutes Space and Water Collaborative. And right now we generally have three co-chairs, but uh, we have one person that moved on to another job in another state. So uh, we'll be looking for another uh, a co-chair. So uh, that's uh, the chairs here. Um, I jump into the yeah history. Yeah. So the the Water Collaborative is a, a group made up of many of folks here. And just a little bit of the, of the history of that is the uh, back with the Deschutes Basin study. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Deschutes Basin study uh, as one was done for the upper uh, Deschutes Basin. Uh, and also there was a, uh, a water summit done by Federal Tribes of Warm Springs and Water Resources Department. And that in 2018, Doug was part of that, uh, Tom Byler and his staff that was put on here in Bend. Uh, we had a, a great discussion about uh, uh, water in the future of the basin, uh, place based planning, uh, what are we going to do into the future, all our different interests, with all the different interests here from um, communities for water for them, water for fisheries, and wildlife habitat, the water for, for ag. Uh, so these are things that uh, we had talked about. And then out of that came uh, the Deschutes Basin um, Collaborative. And it's been a, a good group. It's a very large group. And uh, so we've been um, together since 2000, it was 2018 for the summit and 2019 and right through the pandemic. So that's what this work we've done or did and have been doing through the, the pandemic period, which really slowed a lot of, a lot of folks down. So that's uh, some of the, uh, the history of the, um, how the Water Collaborative came together. Do you wanna go back to the Yeah, go back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm, gonna talk about yeah. Well, uh, I'm gonna do that. Yeah, I'm gonna do that in my okay. presentation we'll also, here. so we'll. Uh, okay, so it's a, Still my turn or your turn? <laughs> so uh, I, I can talk about the phase. Number of membership and goals. Yeah, let's let's yeah. do that, and then we'll then okay. we'll jump into the phase. So um, yeah, as Bobby mentioned, uh, there are there's a very long list of stakeholders who are participating in the in the Shoot Space and Water Collaborative. Um, it, you know, 
three legs of the stool, as we as we call them, are represented in stream interests, agricultural interests, municipal and domestic water supply interests. Um, we have federal, state, and local levels of government, um, and uh, you know it's it's a pretty large basin. Uh, we are only trying to address in this first stage of work for the Chute Space and Water Collaborative the upper Deschutes, um, and even that is you know a, a very large uh, set of stakeholders. Uh, we are gathered around the table, engaged in direct dialogue and trying to uh, develop agreements uh, that we can all uh, support and move forward with to address all of the concerns represented by those three legs of the stool. So that's a little bit about the membership. And um, you know, from your discussion this morning, you have a very good sense that there is a whole lot of, there are a whole lot of projects in the works um, that we want to see implemented. Um, that's that, you, you. You just saw a slice of the project, of course, in the base of that that we want to see implemented. Um, so that's a big focus of the the water collaborative is helping uh, to move forward implementation of uh, high agreement collaborative projects. Uh, we also are working right now on developing a comprehensive water management plan. You're going to hear more about that um, throughout the day. But I'll I'll just give you a sense that we are already into drafting the the fourth of five chapters, uh, and um, it, it's uh you know it, it's one of those go slow to go fast type type things, um, where uh, bringing along that broad stakeholder set is is a uh, challenging, um, but it it pays off so much in terms of being able to put forward projects that everyone can support uh, and move those forward uh, at the end of the planning process. We're also uh, interested in, in um, finding opportunities to leverage funding. There is uh, there are all kinds of uh, federal and as you as you well know, state opportunities. Um, and there are times when we can uh, within irrigation districts, within local governments, uh, uh, within uh, other community stakeholders, private, private philanthropy, we can find funds to uh, all bring together in a synergistic way to, to get more done. And um, we're also interested in policy making. So there's, uh, we, we have a subgroup of, of the, the Water Collaborative right now that is uh, trying to think about what we could possibly all support in terms of a legislative agenda uh, uh, for the state legislature in the coming session in 2025, for example. Um, so those are those are some of the ways that the collaborative works together. And um, as as I mentioned, we are just now focused on the upper Deschutes Basin, uh, but there is a, a an interest in uh, doing work in that in that geography and then expanding and and focusing on other parts of the basin. Uh, because, you know, with water, everything is connected. Um, and some of the things, some of the goals that we want to achieve, even in the upper Deschutes Basin, are really dependent upon things that are happening in other parts of the basin and vice versa. So uh, to have a, a whole basin approach in the long run is is uh, where we're headed. And I'm going to add on to that. So, yeah, that's a very important. That's something in the, the water summit that we had talked a lot about is this is a basin, entire basin approach. And this is the first phase here in this map that you're seeing that we're working on. And so it's a top-down approach, working on the upper basin, try to do all the right things there because when we do right things in the upper basin, it also helps the lower basin. But we're not forgetting the lower basin. There's still a lot of work there. The tribes ourselves, we're in the lower basin. And so, you know, we're thinking about this and what does this mean for us and, and moving forward. So. I, I a lot of times the, the group will hear me saying I'm the conscious of the group here about we're uh, the entire basin it's, and don't lose lose that that thought that uh, because we're working so much in the in the upper basin that we still have a lot of work to do in lower basin and working with other communities and Warm Springs being one of those 
often being another one and looking out uh, for those as we move forward. So this is the first phase and the yellow there, you can see it, it's the work that's being done right now and, and, and being looked at. Great, so, so actually the, the upper Deschutes Basin by definition includes the main stem Deschutes above Lake Billy Chinook, middle and upper Deschutes, which you see here in yellow. It also includes the Crooked River Basin and Wychus Creek. Um, those are not included in this phase one effort. So we talked a lot about the cricket this morning. Um, we're gonna leave the cricket and focus on the main stem to shoots. The reason that the, the collaborative is biting off that first, um, there's a lot of reasons, but there's, it's really complicated and there's five irrigation districts that share water storage and it's kind of its own little microcosm of problems and solutions. So that's where we're at now. Uh, my job is to give you, well, we've, we've made a lot of progress uh, in the basin, but we have a lot more work to do, as you'll see. And I'm gonna give you a snapshot of how water works in the Deschutes. I know we don't have a lot of time, so it's gonna be pretty brief, but we have a tour this afternoon where you're gonna see and talk more about all these, all these issues. Um, I put this map up of Oregon because you can see where Central Oregon is there in the middle is remarkably different than the rest of the state. Um, the, the white lines is surface water. Uh, we don't have a lot of surface water. And the reason is the volcanic geology. So that's just an important context for why managing surface water and restoring flows is so important in the Deschutes because we have very little of it. Most of it seeps into the ground and we'll talk about that tomorrow. <clears throat> so if you zoom in on the, on the Deschutes that we're working with here, this is a map um, that shows both, is there a pointer at all? Well, on the, the bottom of the map is um, the Wikiup Reservoir, which is kind of the start of the water management situation in the upper Deschutes and middle Deschutes. And then the river obviously flows, flows north from there. It flows through the city of Bend and Redmond and up to Madras. Um, what you see in the colorful areas are the eight irrigation districts that manage the majority of water in the Deschutes Basin. Um, today, we're probably gonna focus a lot on the two biggest irrigation districts. And so the light green is Central Oregon Irrigation District and the, the red area is North Unit Irrigation District. And what's key about these irrigation districts, and as you all know with water rights, every irrigation district has a different priority date, and that means everything on how reliable the water is for each district. So again, Central Oregon COID has a senior water right, very, um, um, you know, very reliable water until the last couple historic years of drought. And then um, North Unit Irrigation District has the most junior priority date at 1913, and they have um, real issues with water reliability for their water rights. Um, in addition, at the very bottom of the list, you see the Deschutes River coming in with a priority date of a whopping 1983. So the Deschutes River got left out of the equation when water was allocated over 100 years ago. And so that's a lot of the work that my, our organization, the DRC, does in partnership is to, to try to work with water users to restore those flows in stream. Um, the cities also have the need for water. Um, all their future water currently planned is, is um, going to come from groundwater. So there's some challenges on how, how we do that in a basin where we have a closed basin, basically. Talk a little more about that. So the, the major streamflow issues that are driving a lot of the work that we're doing um, stem from the storage and diversion of water in Wikiup Reservoir. Um, so on the left is a picture of what happens in the wintertime. Um, the, the flows get decreased out of the reservoir to store water largely for that North Unit Irrigation District that is water short. They rely heavily on that reservoir. So in the winter, the river gets decreased to, you know, really low flows that are not suitable for fish and wildlife. Um, and then you flip over to the summertime and all that water, and that's the the tadpole diagram on the right, all that water that was being stored is actually released from Wikiup Reservoir into the river, and the river acts like a conveyance ditch basically for about 70 miles until it gets to Bend. And at Bend, you can see in the summertime, 90% of that water gets diverted for irrigated agriculture. And from there, it's distributed uh, you know, through 700-ish miles of irrigation canals all the way to Madras, um, you know, Terrebonne, Redmond, Bend. Um, so these are the, the two biggest stream flow issues in the main stem disputes that we're dealing with are low flows in the winter um, below the reservoir and then low flows below bends in the summertime. So what does that look like? You can see um, that first picture on the top left is the middle disputes below bend. You're going to see this point today on your tour. It no longer looks like this because of the collective work that we, we have done, but this basically was dried up 
every summer. Um, and then the top right is a picture of the upper Deschutes in that stretch I was talking about where the flows get real low in the winter. And then that bottom picture is also below Wiki Up Dam. You can see uh, exposed spawning gravels and obvious challenges for fish and wildlife in that reach. Uh, on top of that, we've been in you know four or five years of really a historic drought. This is Wiki Up Reservoir drained um, for the first time in history. It drained two or three years in a row. Uh, obviously, that creates serious water supply issues for a North Unit that relies on that reservoir. So, you, you know, in Jefferson County, I don't know if you all drove through in the last couple of years and you see about 50% of that farmland has been fallowed. Um, signs like this, no water, no farms, no food, pretty dire circumstances in Jefferson County. So this is, you know, another major need that we're working on meeting. In addition, we have growing communities. Um, Without going too deep into it, we have a, a Deschutes Groundwater Mitigation Program, a U.S. geological study and OWRD studies in the um, 80s and 90s showed that surface water and groundwater are directly connected, so they close the basin to further groundwater appropriations unless you get a mitigation credit, which um, entails transferring senior irrigation district water rights in stream. So you're offsetting your water use, and that's the framework that we've been working under with the cities for in the last 20 years. So what does this all look like from a supply and demand standpoint? I should mention, um, Bobby mentioned the Upper Deschutes uh, River Basin study that we did with the Bureau of Reclamation and the state, and that ended in 2018. And it really gave us, we already had a lot of data and a lot of information in the Deschutes, but that sort of gave us all the information that we needed um, on both supply and demand and the strategies to actually solve the problems. So the next few slides come from um, this study. So 86% of the water rights in the basin are for irrigated agriculture. This is not uncommon on the west side of the Cascades. 12% um, are dedicated in stream, and that's not with a junior priority date. These are water rights that we've transacted with our partners that have senior reliability. So these are actually you know, solid water rights in stream. And then despite what everybody thinks about golf courses and breweries, the cities as a whole only use 2% of the water in the basin. So from a demand standpoint, um, you can see that 80% of the unmet need lies in the rivers. Again, we're making up from a century of over allocation. Um, that, that funny little 12% of municipalities that's coming out of the river um, is the future municipal demand over the next 50 years. The reason that's associated with the river is because as you heard, when um, a city pumps groundwater, they have to put water rights back in stream. So it's a multi-benefit situation. 20% uh, of unmet demand for agriculture, and that is not new acres, that is um, making you know, historic reliability for all the irrigation districts, including those junior irrigation districts. I would say that that, gets, that number gets bigger in a, in a nasty drought year like we've had the last few years. So overall, the shortages um, on a, a median year, we are facing shortages of about 200,000 acre feet. That is the volume of Wikiup Reservoir, just for um, comparison. And this can go up to 400,000 acre feet in dry years to meet all the needs. Um, just for uh, a data point, the annual inflows range from about 860,000 to 2.3 million. So variability, but you can tell those shortages are, are material, right? So luckily, we have been implementing projects over the last 20, 30 years, um, and we have a really good understanding of what the solutions are. Um, I'm just going to put them into three buckets, and we can talk more and see them when we go out this afternoon. But water conservation, irrigation modernization. So large-scale piping is one of the best solutions in the Deschutes Basin, and you can see a picture of that here. I mentioned that volcanic geology. So the water seeps into the ground. So in order to get, you know, get an acre foot to a farm, you have to send two acre feet down the ditch, 700 miles of ditches. So if you can go ahead and pipe those ditches, um, we have the allocation of conserved water statute. We've used that extensively that you can go ahead and protect those savings in stream with the senior water, uh, senior priority date. In addition to the, the main canals, we're pouring money into on-farm efficiency, working with landowners to try to convert from flood to sprinkler, hook them up to pressurized systems and kind of complete that system. Um, so there is a lot of opportunities still in the basin, particularly in COID Craig's district that you'll hear um, for water conservation to generate on the scale of, you know, probably 100, 150,000 acre feet. 
not you know, very material. Um, the other tools we use, we put under the, the heading of water banking or market-based incentives. So um, using the statutes available to us through the state, we can in-stream lease water, we can in-stream transfer water permanently in certain circumstances, and we can trade water between users. Um, this is how we're really trying to solve getting water to the junior user in exchange for flows. We can talk more about that. And then you're familiar with the collaborative basin planning that we're doing. All these needs are interconnected, so we have no choice but to work together and plan together for the future. Um, so this is the, the real complex part of what we're trying to do is that we need to restore those stream flows in the upper disputes in the winter. Um, for a variety of reasons, the river has completely unraveled, but we now have a listed species, the Oregon spotted frog, in that zone. That's like the critical habitat for that frog in the Northwest. Um, that frog is lost, it's wet, it, needs, it lives in wetlands year round. And because of that fluctuation of flows, low flows in the winter, high flows in the summer, um, the river is no longer connected to its floodplain or its wetlands and that frog is at risk. So um, you've heard about the HCP, the Habitat Conservation Plan, irrigation districts and the city of Prineville have agreements in place that include ramping up those flows over time, um, over the next 30 years. And for example, we're moving from 100 cubic feet per second now below the dam to 300, so triple the flows in the next five years. That's a, that's a huge thing. Um, so the problem is that, as I mentioned, North Unit Irrigation District, the most junior district um, at risk producers rely wholly on that reservoir. So we can't really ask them to release any more water than they're already releasing. So this is where the, the real innovation comes in the basin is doing conservation and market-based you know, incentive tools in senior irrigation districts, figuring out a way to move that water, the live flow senior water rights to the junior irrigation district in exchange for flow releases in the winter out of Wikiup Reservoir. That's a lot of coordination. And I will tell you that when you put the state water rights framework on top of that, it is not easy. <laughs> it doesn't actually, the allocation of conserved water statute doesn't work in that situation for us. So there's a lot of innovation working closely with the state to make that happen. And I forgot to add my second arrow. First arrow is like, you know, water going from senior districts north in the basin to junior, and then in exchange for releases from the reservoir. Um, so now I'm just gonna, that's kind of the snapshot of what we're dealing with. Um, there are other stream flow issues in Tumalo Creek and still in the middle Deschutes that we're continuing to work on. But we're going to get um, the voices quickly from each leg of the stool in the room to see what it looks like from their perspective. We're going to start with Craig Harrell, the, the manager of um, Central Oregon Irrigation. Yep, District. and I'm also the president of the Deschutes Basin Board of Control, mm -hmm. which is eight irrigation districts in the state of Prineville, which you heard today. Uh, we signed the Habitat Conservation Plan in December of 2021. It took 10 years to do. Um, and what that did is just spent, we had a lot of work to do. And the work we've done, uh, we've spent $50 million to date in the basin, uh, which has generated about 35 to 36 CFS of conserved water. Uh, because it's been a drought year, it's been a little less. So COID alone on one project generated 30 CFS through that project. And we bank that water in the reservoir to be released in the winter and it's averaged about 7,000 acre feet instead of 10 from that first project but we have a lot more projects to go so coid being the third largest district in the state north unit being the second largest district in the state it's a little upside down world um, coid has a lot of opportunities to find water and and we've been doing that through conserved water projects uh, we've been very aggressive because we have a timeline that is in the HCP that is uh, in two years, we have to have 300 CFS released from Wikiup in the wintertime. Uh, right now, we're at 100, uh, 105 CFS, uh, where five years ago it was 20 CFS. So we've done a lot of work, uh, but that jump from 100 to 300 is, is pretty massive. And that is why the Deschutes Basin has been so aggressive in pursuing these projects. I think it's great for the state that we are ahead. We've always been a progressive state um, as far as water conservation. 
the, the shoot space and has been always the leader in that going back to Ron Nelson and Steve Johnson, my predecessors in this position. And you'll see that when you come out and see the water going over the uh, dam at our diversion. There's 120 CFS going over, which is conserved water that has been permanent and some that's in stream uh, leases. So we do a lot of things to keep water in the middle. Uh, we need to do a lot more for the middle, but uh, today our focus is in the upper and that's moving water from basically COID to North unit and COID conveying that in a way that's more efficient uh, without having losses. So uh, it's a huge lift. Uh, uh, we have very heated uh, discussions about how to do this. Doug and I have had many conversations about how do you fit this into the conserved water statute? And I think we've been doing a very good job. The only reason it works, I think, and we've been doing a good job is the collaborative table. We keep each other honest and everybody has a say in how we do it. So we feel like um, we're at the table. The collaborative table is the only way this works for us in the Deschutes Basin. We're unique. And I think that's why we're so successful in these projects. Should mention there's four irrigation districts with priority dates between COID and North Unit. So we didn't even mention. Yeah, that. <laughs> and, and, and they're all part of the HCP too. And we work with them so that they are not harmed when we're doing these conserved water projects for North Unit. We're making Swally and all these other districts uh, are being uh, having their water rights met. So I'm gonna, we're going to move to the in-stream perspective side of the world. Jeremy, you want to introduce yourself? Yep. Um, Jeremy Allison, work with Central Oregon Land Watch, and we'll, as Kay said, be sharing some of the perspective from in-stream interests working on place-based planning efforts. And I just got this one slide here, and Kate already went through it in pretty good detail, but really the main point I wanted to make is that by 1913, the Deschutes Basin was over-allocated. And that's really left our rivers and creeks at a disadvantage from the start relative to other needs in the basin. Um, and there's a long history, both in Oregon and across the West, of low flows and poor water quality impacting fish and wildlife's ability to survive. And we've seen that again, as folks have said, uh, with the listing of several species under the Endangered Species Act here in the basin, including Oregon spotted frog and, and steelhead. And you know, drought and climate change are only exacerbating these issues. And so from the in-stream perspective, and I think other perspectives would share this, there's really a sense of urgency to develop solutions and solutions that we can implement at scale to address these problems. Um, and, you know, despite some progress, as we heard in, in some of the flow restoration, there's really still a critical flow restoration need across the basin and in all of the stream reaches that we've talked about today. Um, and we appreciate, you know, a lot of work went into development of the Deschutes Basin Habitat Conservation Plan, but it's insufficient. It doesn't restore stream flows to the middle of the Deschutes we just heard or Tumalo Creek. And from our perspective, it's only a partial solution for the upper Deschutes. Um, but we're also really fortunate in the Deschutes Basin, as others have talked about and highlighted, the amount of research and data we've collected here has helped us to outline what solutions we have available. And it's really been a cornerstone to the conversations and work that the collaborative is doing. And the 2019 study that folks have talked about really did give us a roadmap for the solutions that we can implement to meet the needs in the basin, including in stream interests. Um, and, you know, as folks said, we're in the process right now. The collaborative hasn't come to agreement on any of the specifics of a plan. Um, but from Central Oregon Land Watch's perspective, we, we really feel the need for a more integrative approach that elevates some of the other tools that were identified in the 2019 study. Um, the piping of district canals is necessary, but it alone is not going to meet uh, the flows in the upper Deschutes required under the Habitat Conservation Plan in the winter. And it's relatively slow and expensive to implement. Um, and again, you know, from Central Oregon Land Watch's perspective, if we're going to meet the needs in the basin, we really need to address the inefficient use of water on the thousands of uh, private properties that are in the senior districts in the central part of the basin. And there's really two main opportunities ahead of us to do that. Uh, if implement efficiency standards and regulation or develop an integrated plan that really elevates the piping of private laterals and on-farm work and uh, implementation at scale of market-based incentives. 
So sort of in summary, I think, you know, the solutions are known. We've done a lot of work to study and identify those. And at, from the in-stream side, we're optimistic we can put this plan together. But uh, as others have said, we still have a lot of hard decisions ahead to make. Thanks. We're going to go now to the municipal side with Lori Feha, the City of Bend's water guru. Water guru. Nice. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Lori Feha. I'm Environmental Resources Manager for the City of Bend. So representing Bend, but also representing Central Oregon Cities Organization, COCO. Um, we are always really thrilled to be working. We work collaboratively with the other cities, and then we work collaboratively with all of these other partners represented. Um, it's kind of interesting. I, I kind of think of us as, in some ways, the little skinny third leg of the stool because we're the um, we're just the two percent that Kate showed on the pie chart up there of water use. It always really shocks people to see that municipal use is such a tiny, tiny little fraction of water use. Um, but we represent one hundred fifty thousand people population and rapidly growing cities. Um, when Kate mentioned, um, I guess a couple of things. One is, uh, no, we don't provide any drinking water to water any golf courses. People always think that's the case too. Bend provides to zero. Other than one asterisk, uh, we provide um, treated wastewater effluent reuse water to one golf course. So, um, the, the collaborative is, is really important to us. The collaborative work in the past and the mitigation program that was mentioned is what has given the opportunity for city growing, fast growing cities to be able to access some water. And Kate showed the, you know, a big part of the future deficit is related to municipal growth. Now that was like 80%, what does that mean? Well, when you're taking 2%, you know, maybe that, becomes 3%, um, but it's, so it, it's, it's a tiny amount of the water, but we feel we have a really significant, important part to play to be as conservation minded as possible with municipal water. Um, keeping growth within cities is a really important part of that um, because uh, we're able to keep the gallons per capita per day much lower within urban growth boundaries and smaller lots and things like that. And a lot of um, really extensive water conservation programs that you'll get a chance to hear about at your first stop on the, on the field trip. So we're looking forward to hosting you. Um, the, the mitigation program is really important to us and we see uh, this collaboration as an opportunity to hopefully see that program continue into the future as um, despite our best efforts to do as much conservation as possible, the growth that we're seeing um, is still likely to mean some more pressures on demand. So we really appreciate that opportunity to all be working together and find solutions together uh, in the space. Thanks, Lori. Just as a teaser at your third stop, you're going to see the flows in the middle deschutes. 40 cubic feet per second, 43 came from permanent transfer of urbanizing acres that generated mitigation credits for the city's water supply. So really interconnected. Um, so I'm just going to finish up with a couple of slides. This is the where we're at in the plan build process for the place-based planning. Um, as you know, the state has a place-based planning program. Um, we're actually not one of the four official place-based planning pilots because we have been doing this. We, we were already doing this before the program started, but we are following the guidelines for this comprehensive plan that we're writing. We're on the fourth step. We're writing and reviewing now. We're on chapter four out of five, as somebody mentioned. And so we hope to, to finish this plan um, this next year. Uh, the partnership with the state is really important for the effort in just a couple, a couple of ways. Um, we've mentioned the data that we have in the districts. I think we're really lucky in this state. We have a lot of data compared to a lot of places that's allowed us to really move forward. We have the information by and large that we need, although of course we will continue to probably need more information um, as the groundwater conversation heats up and other things. Um, just some examples of the data that we've had, the USGS groundwater studies that I mentioned, the Upper Deschutes River Basin study. And then this is just a, a a screenshot um, yesterday from a website from Reclamation that shows all the reservoirs and all the stream gauges in real time in the Deschutes. And so we are the most gauged, I believe the most gauged basin in the state, which makes it much easier to manage water amongst all these uses. So we're thankful for the data that the state has helped generate. It's really important. Um, 
state capacity is, is critical for this effort. And I would say for any of the place-based planning efforts, um, not every basin has an Emily. Um, Emily was gifted to the students <laughs> a couple of years ago um, as the first complex basin coordinator, which is now senior water advisor. Um, having that liaison between really that complexity we're dealing with in Salem has been absolute game changer. And so, uh, you know, the more people like that we can get in different areas of the state, I just think is going to help move those regional planning efforts forward. And then it's not just OWRD. Um, I should mention our local staff are amazing as well. Um, it's also the, you know, ODFW, DEQ, all these different agencies. We know that what 14 agencies involved in water, we need those key agencies to be involved in these efforts and to be able to have the capacity to coordinate amongst themselves as well to support these efforts. Um, of course, funding uh, these, these efforts are expensive and we're gonna continue to need, you know, state funding to help leverage other funding, both for planning and implementation. And then, you know, I think it's really important that we integrate this place-based planning effort or any regional planning effort um, with the, the goals of the integrated water resources strategy. Um, we don't want to, we're not off doing our own thing that doesn't meet state goals. Um, we think we can help a lot with the solution set because we, we, we understand the context and the players and we have the relationships, um, but we need a framework to work within that really holds up the goals of the IWRS. Um, so thank you for the, the partnership thus far, and we really look forward to coming back sometime soonish and sharing our plan with you and hopefully getting that adopted and continuing to increase the acceleration. Um, that's all we had. Um, happy to, yeah, anyone's happy I, to. And I wanna just do one thing here is uh, in the audience, anyone who's participated in the collaborative or a part of the collaborative, please raise your hand. Thank you. Any questions for the panel? I have a few. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mall. Hey, thank you all for what I know is just extraordinary amount of work over a long time. Um, I got a question of Pine Packs, Kate. Uh, I wish I could have held on to exactly how you said it. You said it kind of quietly for the number of the number of problems there, the number of reasons that the, the shoots is, is you said something that was as messed up as it is. And I'm thinking about that winter flow, especially. Maybe you all have summarized why, 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 why if, I mean, pre reservoirs, uh, you would still have had obviously different winter flows because of cold and temperature and that thing. But why do we have such a low winter flow what it obviously drought is there but what are you feel like or the what you will collectively feel like are the issues that are driving that yeah and, and i'll start with i didn't go into sort of the natural hydrograph but the deschutes is a really unique spring fed river so historically the flows in the winter we're about six, you know, we'll just say 600 CFS in the summer, 800 CFS. The range was pretty steady. Um, so the, the sole reason that the low flows happen is because the irrigation districts are storing water in the reservoir. So they're basically, you know, turning off the river to some extent to store water. Um, I mentioned that North Unit Irrigation District has a junior priority date. So the live flow rights are hardly ever available to them. So what the federal government did is it came in in the 50s and it built North unit, a reservoir. There's actually a couple of reservoirs, but I'm going to keep it simple. Um, and so when they built that reservoir, you know, North unit's able to access that stored water. But in doing so, to create that that pool, they have to turn they turn the river way down. Yeah. So we have that to deal with, which is fun. Um, and then the, my other question has to do with the land use side of things. I mean, I, I, I know it's probably, a, it is probably a fair bit of hyperbole, but there's a growing distinction between real farming and hobby farming. And certainly when you look at the breakup of land that has occurred in the number of uh, properties where people are farming, they're, they're irrigating, it's easy to think that a lot of the motivation is to keep their farm deferral because of our land use system. And I'm curious if within Land Watch or elsewhere, there's any talk about going back and looking at that because it, that, that aspect of things doesn't seem to be serving us. And I understand that as soon as you stop irrigating a crop on land that's been converted, you have a huge weed problem. That's a big problem for big ag. 
<laughs> um, to everybody. I, is anybody talking about that? Uh, allowing someone to have a different categorization that would roll over their farm deferral and say, but you don't have to use the water. Let's keep the water in stream or underground. I'd say it's come up. Um, what I would point to is that, you know, in some of the senior districts, roughly 80% of the patrons are on three acres or less, I think is the number that came out of one of the studies. And so it's a it's an issue that needs to be discussed. And if that's the solution or not, I think is to be seen. Yeah. So just to put it in perspective, COID has 3,620 patrons for 40,000 acres. North Unit has 900 for its 50,000 acres. Uh, I'd say a third of our district is people that make money farming. A third of our district is people that are lifestyle 4-H. And then we have a third that have been urbanized and we're trying to get a handle on that. Those are the opportunities that we're using to look for how, to, and right now water law does not allow us to transfer to the city or to a junior district. So those are the things that we're looking at. It is the yeah. I just add, it's the reason that we um, those market based incentives are a way to instead of using a hammer, using a carrot, and saying if you you know if the, your water is not important to you, you're you come from California, you have no idea how to irrigate. We'll lease that water from you and and pay you some money. Yeah, I'd say the the best thing mm -hmm. about that process going that in my position, the minute you come say you're taking something from a district is the day. COID does not have to be at the table. We go we away. Take his ball. Yeah. yeah, we take our ball and go. And that's my, I'm just speaking, you know, no, I, hypothetically, but you, you're dealing with five board members that are probably average 70 years old, know a different way of life. And so this incentive is really important to keep everybody at the table and playing. You just add, um, it's really challenging to sort uh, sort farms. Um, say you know you're doing a good job. You're doing it not. <clears throat> you're not, um, or you're a hobby farmer and you're you're not. Um, <clears throat> some of the most ex you know to me some of the most exciting agriculture that's happening uh, in the Deschutes Basin is uh, small uh, direct market producers growing, you know, fruits and vegetables or, or uh, um, you know, you know, raising sheep, you know, sheep, goats, you know, all kinds of things on a, a very small scales um, and, uh, you know, selling into local markets. There are, there are a lot of, a lot of uh, farmers in the shoot Basin that are growing very large acreages of pasture or, or hay. And, you know, that's great too, but I, I wouldn't say that, uh, you know, the direct market farmers are any any less, you know, lesser farmers are less important, even though they might be doing what they're doing on four or five acres, uh, very small, very small acreages. Uh, so uh, I, I think a, a part of our goal should be that, uh, you know, kind of encouraging productive use of water or, or you know, higher value uses of water. Um, whether that be on farm or whether that be in stream um, throughout the basin. And, and, and so nuancing that out, kind of sorting, for, sorting farmers into buckets and, and being able to kind of provide education, technical assistance, encouragement, incentives in the buckets where it's needed, uh, you know, is, is some of the problem that I, or some of the challenge that we have in the basin. Great. Um, I might just add one other piece, and, and it's sort of anecdotal, but uh, the solutions we talked about of implementing the piping of private laterals and market-based incentives so we can move water, water more easily. Anecdotally, I think there are individuals who, who would just give their water up if they had that pathway available to them. And so uh, it's sort of a mix of, of what was said and, and that opportunity as well. Okay. Thank you. I guess to... We have the same goal, everybody here at the table. It's just how we get there. We all talk differently about it. And we don't always make it easy for you to do what you want to do. Who <laughs> <laughs> said that? It's true. It is true. Any questions or comments?
I have a comment. I was thinking about the, the, the piping projects are great in this. We had a long, obviously, a conversation about the Makai project and some of that infrastructure, I think, was 60 years old. Some of the pumps. That, 1916. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, just, you know, thinking down the road, um, 50, 60 years, what infrastructure maintenance is going to be needed and it makes me think back to the the whole concept of the uh, 100 year vision and having you know programs for built infrastructure and natural infrastructure and how in my mind anyway that that's still needed because you can see these cycling through um i, I think there's some great progress here i, I just see a, a long-term need for o&m yeah, some of the piping projects I think are exciting. Okay. I thought you said there were a lot of questions. Wow. <laughs> I'll ask more, but they gave me lunch, so I was <laughs> ask one last field trip. We're gonna hear yeah, when about groundwater and the tension that we have in this space in particular. And the issues that you're dealing with and this perception that we must feed the masses of people that are going to come here and housing and, and the county commissioner position, you're caught in that crossfire. But particularly from the um, from cocoa, cocoa perspective, this uh, spring fred water system and the groundwater connection, and is it something that you all are wrapping into your plan or are you setting that one aside? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to both questions. The, time, the timeline is such that we're waiting on the groundwater allocation rules are not final yet. So we, we we're a little hamstrung on, on fully incorporating that into the plan and we're trying to get it finished. So we are in all the, the, the plan development conversations, we're thinking about it, we're talking about it. Um, the mitigation program is absolutely in the plan, um, but these sort of emerging groundwater issues, we're, we're doing as best as we can to key those up for the future conversations. I think what's what's important is it is gonna get more complicated and spicier, absolutely. Um, but because we have this history of working together, we're gonna be able to handle it. Like we will figure, we will figure it out together, which I think puts us a little bit, um, it's good thing. We need to figure it out yeah. together because, so the mitigation program has allowed the cities um, a pathway to um, access water for, you know, in the, in the past couple decades. Um, we need it to continue so we can continue to build out the water rights we have um, when we project forward, not just the 20 years that the state makes us look at from water resources and from land use perspective, but we like to look 50 to 100 years ahead because we're building really expensive pieces of infrastructure. Um, we, with best efforts at, um, and, and we can talk more about this this afternoon about water conservation and things like that. We've been doing a lot. Um, we don't see it being quite enough. And we're very concerned about having an ability to access enough in the future. Um, it's not my job as a water manager to say growth has to stop. <laughs> That's not my job at all. My job is to provide water um, efficiently. And so, but it's it's collaboration like this, continued collaboration that I think is our best hope to figure out all of the, all of the needs for the story. I mean, I, I just like to say that, um, the problem we need to solve in the Deschutes Basin is declining groundwater levels. And this groundwater allocation rulemaking doesn't fix it. I mean, it may prevent, it may prevent the problem from accelerating, but we are experiencing declines, you know, in the Bend and Redmond area, a foot a year on average for the last couple of decades. Uh, and that's from the permits and, and exempt wells that are currently uh, in use, plus, you know, uh, climate dealing us a uh, 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 shorthand for, for a number of years now. Uh, so, I, you know, I, my hope is that uh, the, the uh, in our planning effort, we're not just we're not just responding to the groundwater allocation rulemaking. 
but we are going beyond that and trying to understand what we do uh, to not not just not make the pro problem worse, but to slow or reverse the decline of these groundwater level declines. And that's that's going to take us into a lot of other places besides new permits. So one other comment, um, you made the comment about some of these small farms producing products that go direct to market. Um, and I think one thing that gets lost, you know, we're not doing in-stream flows just for the sake of in-stream flows, but rivers can provide fish direct to people and fish are an excellent source mm -hmm. of protein and a healthy food source. Um, obviously, you know, culturally, um, spiritually important to tribes, um, a lot of language around you know, subsistence economies of tribes, but it's more than that. But legally, you know, half the fish are available to non-tribal for harvest. And so, you know, I like to see these in-stream flow projects, but I would like to see us at some point start thinking about how fish are a viable food source that we don't seem to be accounting for um, that is healthy. Uh, you know, promotes uh, healthy in-stream conditions. And um, it just always seems to get lost. I have a different perspective, so that maybe that's why that jumps out at me. But um, over time, I, I would like to see us thinking about that and how that can be something that people enjoy. My personal experience in the Umatella Basin is people be enjoy being able to harvest salmon both from the tribal side and the non-tribal side. Um, and there, there is a real food value to fish that I don't think we account for. Thanks, Eric. You're kind of opening the door for me and I have my presentation. I'm gonna talk a lot, a lot more of that in my presentation. Okay. Mr. Chairman, it sounds like they'd like us to, to uh, finalize the uh, groundwater rules today. Is that <laughs> <laughs> We have eight alternatives for that. <laughs> can I ask one? Can we have more questions? I know we're tomorrow. <laughs> I know people want to eat lunch, but somebody mentioned that they thought there were um, uh, irrigators, small farms, maybe uh, across the basin that would give up their water rights if they had a pathway available. And I was curious about is the is the pathway not available because of money or because of the constructs that this agency has in place for how you can move water around or what? Well, I disagree with that statement yeah. <laughs> because my board wants to have the water put to its highest best use. Now, whether that's giving that water up, where do you give it up to? Are you giving it up to the river? Are you giving it up yeah. to the north unit? Are you? So that's why these water banking, it's, you know, moving it efficiently to the highest best use, whether that's the city. So you're not just giving it up, you, you know, basically. You're not going to give somebody a million dollars to give their water to a pool because people will do that. Well, our boards are there to say, no, that water is meant to be on land and be used at highest, best use. So my board would disagree with that. I've heard them say that for 10 years. We want us to <laughs> I think I understood from the context of the comment that they were talking about water in stream, but I might have been jumping. But, but, but there is incentive there for them to be done temporarily in different areas. Well, just to clarify, the state pathways exist. Um, districts, each district has its own policies on what can be done with that water. The district has to say, not the landowner. So we used to have a water bank where we were actually um, permanently transferring water from the districts to in-stream. That's what generated the mitigation credits. Um, only one irrigation district is currently using that pathway. So our efforts to build a water bank are in the hopes that some of the other irrigation districts will find it in their in their benefit. They're worried about their financial and operational wholeness, basically. And I think maybe I made that comment. You might be referencing it. And what I would say is if market-based programs were scaled and available to more individuals across all the districts, that would there be opportunity to move water to the more junior river and farmers in the north part of the basin where there's a much greater shortage for water today. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We're just talking about logistics and trying to accommodate the all the agenda items on the um, 
agenda and be respectful of our presenters. So we'd like to move to Bobby's presentation. We'll distribute lunch to the commissioners and take things there while we <laughs> put things up and then be quiet when Bobby can. They're all leaving please. me. Please. And, uh, <laughs> Good luck, Bobby. <laughs> Hope you up. So if you get them out of the wrappers, less noise. No, we have it as an agenda. I definitely have my agenda is not the most recent one. The most not the most recent. Or forgotten for sure. Okay. You're a unit lonely. I should know this song. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? Stop. Look at that. Already. Okay. I'm just going to drink the regular. Number one, in case you run out. Great. Thanks. Do you look like you're thirsty? <laughs> and messy. <laughs> They had <laughs> baby seal. <laughs> um, so if you go ahead and unwrap everything, that'll help. Is it up here? Get for the present. And I think we're just almost ready to get started. Let me ask you. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you again, Commission and, and Chair Quimps. And um, so I'm gonna have to do an overview um, of, the, of the tribes and a little bit about, about water and, and some of the things that, that Chair Quimps was talking about, about spirituality and connection to the fish and that, and uh, how that also ties into the, uh, the collaborative and the work that we've been doing here. Uh, this one is a, a photo of Mount Jefferson. And the reservation boundary goes to the top of Mount Jefferson. And Mount Jefferson's over 10,000 feet. And then that canyon sea below there is the uh, what we call white water. We're not seeing what we're not doing. seeing it yet. Yeah. You're not seeing it on the. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Kills. <laughs> Coming back. <laughs> Got it. There we go. Yep. Great. Okay. Mount Jefferson and the reservation boundary goes to the very top of Mount Jefferson, over 10,000 feet. Um, and then the canyon below is the uh, uh, Whitewater Canyon and um, very diverse there. I originally took this photo, you can't see in there, but we released some uh, mountain goats since so we have mountain goats in that canyon and in, in that, that country there. It's not forwarding. 
Now it's now it's working. IT guy shows up and it just has so it. I had it shoot with the button. And oh, that I, house is not for that house. And um, so I ended up using my cursor. Yeah, you into the arrow. Yeah, the arrow. There it is. Okay, thank you. So, Confederate Tribes of Warm Springs, who, who we are. So, the Confederate Tribes of Warm Springs is made up of three tribes the Warm Springs tribes, the Wasco tribes, and the Paiute tribe. And um, myself, I'm, I'm Wasco, and so it's now afternoon, so I'd have to greet you in the uh, Kitsch language, would be Itakti Wigwa. So Itakti Wigwa, everyone, for afternoon afternoon greeting from a Wasco person. And uh, so you have the, the three tribes. Two of the tribes come from the Columbia River. That's Warm Springs people, and the Wasco people. Uh, we come from around Celilo Falls, the Dalles, on, on down the river. Uh, the Paiute people come from the high plateaus southeast of, uh, of here. And that's the... Um, the tribes are, and this is a photo of Celilo Falls. And uh, and if you look at the bottom there, I don't know if you can see that or not. Yes, you can. Um, Celilo Falls was inundated uh, March 10th, 1957. And uh, by the Dalles Dam, uh, the, you can go read uh, about this, but when the, the gate shut on the Dalles Dam, it was just a few hours before that the Salado Falls was flooded over. It was incredible, they said, and um, all, how quickly it, it covered. So that's a, a day that, uh, and I say March 10th, that in, in Warm Springs, and I know with uh, our, our cousin tribes, the Umatillas, Yakimas, and Isperus, that's a, a mournful day for us when um, that day comes around. Our culture. This one I, is a slide that I worked with back, actually back in the uh, late 90s with our culture committee made up of these ladies that were in their 80s and in their 90s. And I was, I wanted to get their blessing on this slide. So I've had this slide for a very long time. I've changed the photo on it, but basically the slide written part is, um, was approved by these ladies culture committee and, uh, and I asked him, I said, I want to be respectful. I want to make sure I'm saying the right thing. And I want my elders' approval uh, to move this forward. And they said, yes, we need people to know who we are and understand who we are. And uh, so this is the, the slide I was approved with these ladies in their 80s and 90s. And one of them was my grandma, and she was in her 90s when she was on that, that committee. And so what it is, is the gifts of the creator. And the creator gave us these gifts and in order. And the number one gift is water. Water was to take care of all these gifts. Water is number one. Number two is fish, salmon, all the fish in, in the streams. Number three was the wildlife, the deer, the elk, all the animals, take care of those. And then the fourth was our our cultural foods, the being the roots and the berries and medicinal plants uh, were important to us. And we're supposed to take care of these and not use more than we should be using and have these sustainable and, and look after these. So just some that the, the creator gave us. And this is a way of our life still for many of our, our tribal members. And we still celebrate these things every year. We, uh, we don't go fishing until we've had a salmon feast and we've honored the salmon. We don't go root digging until we've honored those, those roots and then we go out and, and dig those roots. We don't go pick huckleberries and those huckleberries and gone and then we can go and pick huckleberries. So these are very important to us culturally, but it's also from a, uh, how we manage our lands and how we think about natural resources is uh, this is what's in our heads and this is what we think about. 
and we connect that back on how we take care of these things um, for future generations. You always hear seven generations and and longer. So that's what's what's in our minds and, and thinking about. And I know Eric does work with his tribe, does a very similar, similar thing with um, taking care of these special things from the creator. A little bit about our uh, treaty. Uh, we have a treaty we signed in 1855 on June 25th uh, with the U.S. government. And in that treaty, we reserved rights. We reserved rights to fish, to hunt, to gather our cultural foods, and to pasture livestock on unclaimed lands. What are unclaimed lands? Unclaimed lands or forest service lands, Bureau of Land Management lands. These are places where we can exercise our rights. Claimed lands are private property, and those are um, where we're not able to go in uh, to those areas. But so that's our, our treaty right. And then there's a key word, a very important word, and I should bold it sometime, and that's reserved. We reserved rights. We never gave up any rights. People say, well, you gave up rights. No, we never gave up any rights. We reserve those rights for now and for into the future and future generations. So very important word there is uh, reserve. And also with doing that, we have uh, the U.S. government has a trust responsibility. So the Forest Service and the BLM and other agencies to also look out for these resources that we've reserved and to take care of them. And so we lean on them about making sure they're doing their job to look out for these resources that uh, are treaty resources for, for their tribes. So that's why I have this uh, piece at the bottom there about the trust responsibility on the U.S. government and looking out for these resources, the tribes. And the, um, the photo there is a photo of the uh, actual treaty. It's just one page of the actual treaty. Here a few years ago, that the actual treaty was in Warm Springs for the first time ever. And it was at our museum. They was armed guards came with it. It came in an armored truck at armed guards there. And, uh, and it was, it's pretty cool to have that uh, there actually come to Warm Springs. And it's, it's many pages long. And now it's back, back over in, in Washington. Okay. <clears throat> I think we did good this morning, honey. <laughs> <laughs> In the treaty, it describes uh, boundaries, a couple boundaries. Uh, the, they describes the boundary of the reservation itself. The reservation is uh, from where we're at here is 50 miles away to where uh, Warm Springs is. Uh, the boundary of the reservation is described in the treaty. Uh, the reservation itself is 640,000 acres in size proper or 1,000 square miles. And you'll see the green there. Uh, most of the time folks are driving through Warm Springs. They drive through the dry part of Warm Springs. They drive through the rangeland part and they, or they're floating down on the, on the Deschutes River. And the Deschutes River is the eastern boundary there, which is like 30 some, 35 miles long, 36 miles long. And so they always think the whole reservation is just rangelands and dry. Well, that's not the case. Most of the reservation is in forested lands. 444,000 acres of our reservation is in forested lands. It goes from the top of Mount Jefferson and the crest of the Cascades, which is we're talking about 100 inches of rain, all the way down to the rangeland to, to 9 to 12 inches of, of precept. And it's a, a forest that's very diverse um, on the northern end of the reservation is the most southern reach of Alaska yellow cedar ends on us. And then on the south end of the reservation, the most, most northern reach of sugar pine ends on, on the reservation. So we have a little bit of everything for a temperate forest. We get a lot of scientists and foresters from universities coming out and, and visiting our forest because it's so unique. Uh, and when I say that, I'm saying international. Uh, we've had the Russians, Bolivians, the Chinese, the Australians, the Germans. If you just name any country that has a temper, they, they've pretty much been giving them tours of uh, our forest. So that's the, the reservation that's uh, described in the, uh, in the treaty. 
This is the also a boundary uh, described in the treaty of 1855, and that's our ceded lands. Lands that we ceded to the US government and where we still have reserved rights uh, to exercise in these ceded lands. And I'll walk you through that. Um, the most of you know where Cascade Locks is. So just go down the river from Cascade Locks and then head south on the crest of the Cascade. Crest of the Cascade south down past Bend uh, to the 40th parallel. And then from the 44th parallel head east. And it ends uh, the line somewhere on the Forest Service lands and then head north on the crest of the Blue Mountains over to a creek called Willow Creek, down Willow Creek, back to the Columbia River, mid-channel of the Columbia River, <laughs> back to its root point. That's 10 million acres of seeded lands. It has seven different forests in the seeded lands there. So you have the Willamette, Mount Hood, Deschutes, the Ochoco, the Umatilla, Malheur, and the Wallawa Whitman. And then you have the Primeville BLM. Uh, so all the green you see there is uh, Forest Service. All the yellow you see, Bureau of Land Management lands uh, in our city lands. So it takes in all the John Day Basin, takes in all the Hood River Basin, and it takes in most of the Deschutes Basin. So that's the seeded lands. And sometimes folks will go, why does it go mid-channel on the Columbia? Well, mid-channel, you go north, and that's our cousins up north, the uh, Yakimas, and their seeded lands abuts our seed lands in the river. And then you go to the east, our cousins, the Umatillas, their seeded lands abut our seeded lands. And so we're all, and we're all, we all know each other, uh, and we all have relatives. I have relatives in Umatilla, I have relatives in Yakima, uh, so we're, we're all connected. And so like in Warm Springs, uh, treaty times, if you lived on the south bank of the river, you ended up in uh, Warm Springs. If you lived on the north bank of the, uh, the river, you ended up in Yakima. So that's how our families got, got split up. So that's the, the ceded lands. And also on this map is um, you see in uh, the purple color there, and you see some smatterings across our ceded lands. You see one big piece there, kind of right in the middle. That's the uh, Pine Creek Conservation Area. That's 35,000 acres that the tribe's own uh, on the John Day main stem. You go to the town of uh, John Day and Prairie City, the next big batch east is Prairie City. We own land there. We own land on the middle fork of the John Day. We own land on the lower. Um, Lower John Day River and clear down at the mouth of the John Day River where Tumwater Falls is. As you go down the Deschutes River along the reservation, you'll see some smatterings of lands there. They don't show up very good, um, but we own land there. Shears Falls is a traditional fishery there that we have. And uh, you go to the mouth of the Deschutes River, we own land at the mouth of Deschutes River. We own land on 15 Mile Creek just outside the Dalles. We own land in Mosier. We own land in um, Hood River. And we also own lands that are mitigation lands for the Pelton Project, along with our uh, partners, Portland G uh, PGE. And uh, you go over the crest of the Cascades, and you'll see lands there, some little purples there. So we own land on the Clackamas River at Austin Hot Springs. We own land, and I think probably almost every one of you has driven through our land uh, on the San Yam Pass in a place called Little Sweden. And we own the land on both sides of the both sides of the highway there. And then over by uh, Lafayette and Dundee in Yamhill County, just barely on the map here is uh, Red Hills, and there's some lands that we own. Uh, over there. So we're, we're all over the place, which leads me into talking about usually on custom stations. So that is another thing in our treaty where we have the rights to go. These are the boundaries we have, but we have, and this is not defined by any boundary in, in the treaty where we, what we call UNA, usually custom, where we can exercise our rights, like in the Gifford Gif Pinchot National Forest, 
at Trout Lake, we have trout members that go huckleberry picking up there every year. We go and set a fisheries in the Collets River down by Longview, Washington for smelt every year. So we have a fishery down there. We have a fishery at Willamette Falls where we go and gather eels every year. And let's set a fishery at Sandy River on smelt also. So those are just an example. There's many other places uh, uh, that are trouble members and people ask, well, why, why is that? Well, that's because when treaty times, they didn't know where all our people were at. They weren't all there during the negotiations. So they wanted to make sure they, wherever they went, they had their rights to go exercise those and be able to go do what they have always done forever. And we've been on this landscape for time immemorial. And uh, so a little bit about UNA um, for, for our tribe. We're a co-manager. We're recognized as a co-manager uh, with the state of Oregon. Example is Columbia River Fishery and, uh, and his tribs and uh, the work that we do on the Columbia. We have a lot of work that we do there. Uh, the photo there is a, a photo of bull trout in Shittite Creek, which is uh, Creek is on the reservation. And uh, we have the healthiest population in lower 48 of bull trout are on the reservation and in our waters. And one of the only few places like on the uh, Lake Billy Chinook where you can actually go harvest um, bull trout. And uh, this photo here, there's about between 100 fish to 75 fish. And the reason I know that, because I was in a wetsuit, dry suit, I mean, swimming with these fish here, taking photos and counting the fish in this pool that we were in. And uh, the other person that was with me with um, uh, Becky Burchell, who works for Portland General Electric at the time, and uh, we kept coming out of the water and it's like, how many fish do you count? She goes, 100. I go, I got 75 and then we go and count again and I come back out, I got 75. She goes, I got 100. I said, okay. <laughs> Just call. <laughs> um, since we're talking about water, uh, this is uh, some timelines on our um, water for the tribe. So, and, um, 1967, August 3rd, the tribes um, approved their, their water code. So we have a, a water code that uh, we've had for a very long time. Again, talking about our elders were thinking about this. This is an important thing from the creator to take care of. So we need to be, uh, as our government was growing, uh, need to take care of that. Uh, formal agreement with the federal government together to quantify tribal water rights was in 1981. And then the formal negotiations teams were appointed by the state of Oregon, the US and the tribes in 1985. And that was the start of our uh, negotiations for our water settlement agreement. And uh, I have a whole nother pre presentation for that that uh, can go an hour to two hours long if everybody was interested in seeing that. Um, and uh, so you can see that was a uh, negotiated, was completed in 1997. So that was 10, 12 years of negotiations of uh, that water settlement agreement. And there was a lot of, it was, I was, I caught, I came in on the tail end of it. It was very interesting to, to observe and, and listen to what the uh, 1985, my dad was uh, on tribal council when they started the, the negotiations. And then it was uh, ratified, the agreement uh, in 2003 uh, here at the courthouse in Bend, uh, Judge Tickton, and that was very interesting. Uh, Josh was there, and uh, they asked uh, if the, we could do a, a prayer song in the court, and so the judge allowed it, and so we had our tribal leadership there and uh, spiritual leaders and they sang a song with their drums in that in the courtroom and um which is uh is very rare it's probably the only time it's ever well in fact it's the only time it's ever happened there and as they started singing and drumming the all the police officers out in the hallway come running into the, <laughs> the courtroom and the judge are like it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that was uh, a little bit of our, um, some timelines on um, our uh, water. Some of the uh, water interests for the tribes and challenges. 
Uh, I've heard the word a couple of times mentioned, but climate change. What's uh, going to happen with our climate? As you know, it's it's changing right now. What does that mean in the future? Our tribal council talks about it a lot. Uh, this council, out of all the councils out of the years I've worked with, uh, with count, past councils, this one's been very engaged on water and wanting to understand what's happening with water and what's happening with climate change. Uh, so that's one of one of the challenges. Uh, we like to see good clean water. Our communities, you know, we're downstream from uh, from uh, everyone up here. And uh, so there's a lot of discussions about how clean is the water? What's the water quality? Is it good enough for, for our communities? Is it good enough for our fisheries? Is it good enough for our wildlife? And again, going back, we come from the Columbia River, we're salmon people. And so what, what's happening to, to those fish and how are we taking care of them? And then do we have enough water? And for future generations, if for all these things that are important to us and all the gifts that the creator gave us, do we have enough water and taking care of our, taking care of our, our people and these resources? Uh, so, you know, water quantity. And then also we have a negotiated water settlement agreement. And so what are we doing and are we looking out for our water rights and in um, protecting that? And uh, I want to thank the uh, the staff for water resources, everyone that we work with here on um, in water transfers and all the hard work that, that we're looking at and they're looking at and making sure we're protecting our our water rights and we're not any of that's being depleted or creating injury on the tribes tribes water rights. So uh, uh, that's another piece that's a uh, you know important that we're charged with and I'm charged with to, to look after. Final slide, why are we doing all this? Is because we have a responsibility to, uh, to these resources and to our community and to our future leaders and tribal members. And this person here, this is at Shears Falls. Uh, this is, uh, he's five years old, it's Jordan Holiday. This is very first salmon he ever caught. <laughs> yeah, Jordan is now married and works at fire management and prevention and uh and so i show him that every one, now and then embarrass him so <laughs> uh so uh very important place this is where i grew up fishing and uh i, I was probably uh, i was a little older than Tim when i caught my first salmon down down at shears falls fishing traditionally off the scaffold and my very first salmon was off the scaffold and uh, i remember those those days and those nights where we'd sit on the scaffold all night long. I was, as a kid, I just like dreaded going down there because I had meant I had to sit on the scaffold all night and I had to pack fish out and then I had to clean fish. <laughs> <laughs> but not anymore. I love, I love going down to that place. So that's one of the things for me to relax is to go to Shears Falls and go, go fishing. So that's my presentation. So thank you all. And uh, got any questions? Bobby? Commissioner Lee? Yes, I have one question, but first I wanted to say that your leadership, your tribal leadership in the water rights settlement and working with all the members in the community and helping protect their rights was a real model that I'd like to see replicated. Um, but my question is, I know you have a lot of land that's within the boundaries also of the U.S. Forest Service. Do you have some kind of a government to government agreement on how that land is dealt with? Good, good question. I uh, we have a MOU with the seven different forests on how we work and communicate with each other. And actually, just yesterday, I was um, talking. I was doing a presentation to the chief of the Forest Service and his executive team. They were on the Mount Hood, so Mount Hood abuts our boundary, and we went to the boundary and talked about uh, you know things that are important to us and like fire rolling from the forest service lands onto us and how do we deal with that? How do we deal with uh, doing conservation work? And I think, I think a lot of folks have heard me talk about this before is, you know, for water quality and quantity, what are we doing for meadows? How are we taking care of these meadows that are sponges and these wetlands that are our filters and cooling water down and recharging the, the groundwater and we need to do more work on the Forest Service lands to restore these um, these meadows systems, and that was one of the places we stopped by a meadow that crossed boundaries. Uh, and the is actually the headwaters of the Clackamas River, 
and the headwaters of Clackamas River starts on the reservation, Warm Springs. And uh, so we were talking about, we had some of our elder, one of our elders there, and we've had past elders there talk about, hey, we're not seeing the roots in that meadow system anymore like we used to see. We're not, the bulrushes are disappearing. The trees are encroaching in on, onto the, the place. Uh, and so there's, so what are we going to do? We should probably be doing more prescribed fire there. We should probably be doing something with these trees that are encroaching. And so that was the discussion we were having yesterday with the, with the forest service, with forest supervisor made a gloss garden and we had the chief of the forest, her boss was there. And so that was, I, I talked to them for, I don't know how long I talked to them, but anyway, they, they gave me the mic and I didn't give it up. So. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I just I want to thank Bobby and add a little bit to what uh, Commissioner Lee said and and thank Bobby for his leadership. You know, and it, it's pretty common in, in at least with the Quitfic tribes for the tribes to have pretty large natural resource departments because it reflects uh, community values and priorities and the importance of the treaty. And you see this this process of people working in natural resources and then because of their experience moving up higher into their tribal organization and serving as executive directors and and that type of role. And, and that's what Bobby is doing now. And I know it's a, a tremendous amount of work and I just want to recognize him for that and thank you for his presentation today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Ready for the tour then? Here we go. Are we going to have these two agenda items before we jump in the car or going straight to the tour? Okay. Oh, I've seen a lot. I have one minute. Um, <laughs> or did you want to? We have not yet. So, two other items. <laughs> I'll go ahead and, and I'll go ahead and get, uh, get throw a question. Go ahead, Commission, and uh, give that work. <laughs> that is that uh, record report is commonly uh, topics of. Thank you, Bobby. <laughs> the director's report, you know, touches on emerging issues and, and provides updates to the commission, and. In this particular case, because we're behind, I'm just going to touch on one thing, an emerging issue since the last time we got together, but one that's very important to the department and to the state, I think, and that is the recruitment of the new director. We have confirmation now of new director, our own Ivan Hall, stepping into the director role starting July 1. Uh, I just want to pledge the well, first of all, he gives his kind regards and regrets that he can't be here. We have pushed him out to some R, much deserved R and R, and um, it was a very difficult and challenging confirmation process that he went through. And he is excited to be in this position. He's excited for the role and the challenges. And through that process conveyed very clearly that there are high expectations see moving forward, streamlining our processes, working on protest backlogs, transparency, working on communications, uh, just a number of things. It's a very long list. And like I said, Ivan is looking forward to the challenge, but we as staff need to acknowledge that we have to be there to support him in this because the expectations so I just want to acknowledge that uh, he gives his best and looks forward to taking over uh, in in this role as director. So thank you, Acting Director Woodcock. I, I want to uh, congratulate Ivan. I, I know he's not here, but um, I understand it was a very challenging process, and uh, he was very patient and diligent through that process. And I also want to thank you for your role as acting um, I know it's a very challenging role to serve in. I think you've done an excellent job and, and we appreciate it. And, and I appreciate that you talking about this transition, also talk about the work coming forward and you know the expectations. And I think that's important. 
appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's see. Chair Quims, would you like me to uh, cover the other item? Yes. Okay. Uh, so again, for the record, Raquel Rancier, Deputy Director at the Water Resources Department. One of two, uh, the title's way too long. So, um, but I just wanted to give a quick update on agenda item B. So um, as I noted previously, we're skipping a couple items um, and really what the commission needs to know on this report in one minute or two is um, if you look at the attachment, um, the first attachment, attachment one, you will see that there is a line um, on this attachment in the table. And that line designates what we have approval to submit. And so if you go to page five, you'll see there's a dark bold line, everything above that we have approval to submit so long as we stay within our 1% that we are allowed to ask for in terms of budget requests. So this is about what policy option packages we can submit in our agency request budget. I'll note that we still have additional conversations with the governor's office that, that will occur probably in July. Um, but I just wanna note for all of you that in terms of what we have received authorization to move forward on, it's that 1%, not more, okay? Um, and then the other item I would just note for you in terms of our legislative concepts. So if you go to page two of the staff report, you'll see there are on there five uh, legislative concepts. We recently received information that the water rate transaction, so number four, process improvements, legislative concept, which was going to be a true placeholder, as in we knew we would not have any language to submit, um, and it would need to then just be amended during session. The governor's office has asked us to not submit that one, and but to continue work. So we will continue work on trying to identify improvements um, to the water rights program. Um, however, uh, if we do identify improvements for legislation, it'll be done through a different bill vehicle. So it won't be a, a water resources department bill. So we will continue work on it. We'll continue discussions with um, the interested parties, um, but just note that uh, we won't have our own legislation, but we will be working with other folks should uh, we have legislation to bring forward. So those are the updates you need to know. And I think we can all take a break then, unless there's any questions, um, and use the restrooms and get ready to um, load up into the van, which I will note, Dwight moved it to the correct door. So not go out to the door we came in this morning, commissioners, go out that door, and the van is out there. Any questions for Raquel? Is there room in the van for those of us that didn't come in the van this morning to come in the van now? Uh, so commissioners will ride in the van. Um, I asked you not to follow in your vehicles because we want to limit how many vehicles we have on the roads. Um, members of the public, we do have instructions. If you would like to follow along in your own vehicle, um, you are welcome to do that. Uh, we will try to have staff in the vans with you all in case... Um, like I think Jeremy and Carolyn would be great because they know the area. Um, but we may, depending on how many folks we have, we may need to take one or two more vehicles. We'll assess that as we get out to the uh, vans. All right. And Are we gonna we're gonna come back here then? Um, we do have to come back here because some people have their vehicles here. So, as we said earlier today, while while we're touring, it's still part of the meeting. Not adjourning until we return from the tour, correct? Yes. So uh, we won't be adjourning on. So this is the end of the meeting for today, except for, of course, the tour. We won't come back and gavel in and out or something like that. Um, but I do want to remind folks that um, in terms of rulemaking, rulemaking, we do have uh, an agenda item scheduled tomorrow. I know there's a lot of interest in the groundwater allocation rules. The tour is not to the place to discuss that. Tomorrow's agenda item is the place to discuss that if you want to talk with commissioners or commissioners, if you want to talk with folks, that's what we set up as the venue for folks to be able to have those conversations. So that way we can have it on the record. All right. We can talk amongst ourselves. Raquel's going to get you. So. <laughs> I think we're uh, going to uh, at least 
go to our tour portion of it. Put a screen. 